So was she possessed by a demon, you believe? So then again, I had her go through steps to see a psychiatrist. Okay. So he saw <laughs> <laughs> he saw her morph into a reptile and it's still no He's demon. Like, have still you no seen demon. the doctor, though? <laughs> <laughs> to me, there's no such thing as an emergency exorcism. When those things are done <laughs> is when problems really... Do you think Jesus thought there was no such thing as an emergency exorcism when that demon was throwing the guy into the fire? Mm-hmm. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. This is your brother, Chris LaSala, coming to you from BDS in Corsicana, Texas. I'm here with my brother, Don. Most of you know who he is. He has a channel called Young Don Reborn. You might want to check that out. And brother Ben is with us today. And we are going to be reviewing Patrick Bet Davis as he reviews, well, as he interviews a Catholic priest. So let's get right into it. Brother Vincent Lampert, thank you so much for taking the time and being a guest on the podcast. Yes, I'm happy to be here. So, very open-ended question. You know, it's a simple question, but maybe a complicated one for us when we kind of look at you from our perspective. You know, some of us wake up, we say we want to be an astronaut. You know, we want to be a doctor. We want to be engineers to make our parents proud. I want to be a basketball player. I want to be a baseball player. I want to be a, you know, hedge fund manager. Who wakes up saying one day I want to do exorcism? Mm -hmm. Like, how does that come about? I think I woke up one day and said I wanted to be a priest. Okay. But then in the Catholic tradition, it's the bishop of every diocese who is the exorcist. Because when Jesus sent the 12 out, he gave them authority over every unclean spirit. And then a bishop of a diocese can't appoint one or more of his priests to do this ministry in his name. So when I was appointed in 2005, I jokingly tell people I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because you mentioned earlier there were only 12 exorcists in the United States back in 2005. Mm -hmm. The Archdiocese of Indianapolis, where I am a priest, was a diocese that always maintained having an exorcist. So even when the practice fell out in many dioceses across the world, Indianapolis decided to always have a priest in his position. And then ironically, the priest who was the exorcist, uh, he was the pastor of the grade school where I attended. And he passed away in 2005. And then all the priests, we began kind of trying to stay under the radar so that the bishop would not appoint us to be the exorcist. But I happened to have a meeting with the bishop one day, and he said, I'm appointing you to be the exorcist. I don't really know what I'm asking you to do, but I'm going to send you to Rome, and you can learn what the ministry is really all about. Let me summarize what he just said. He wasn't called by God to be an exorcist. Yep. You got tapped. Yeah, they tapped on his shoulder. They were like, somebody else died. You're the guy we're going with. So right there, he just confessed the Catholic Church doesn't choose people who are chosen by God for a position. They don't sit back, wait to see someone's background, what they've been through. You know, the your past determines what your calling is going to be. So in real life, let me let me explain to everybody what happens in real life. God grabs somebody likely that was a demoniac that came to Christ so they could understand what it's like to deal with demonized people and they could have compassion on demonized people. He raises them up, puts the desire in their heart to serve him, and then he gives them the ability the revelation, and the power to go ahead and do that. So when he says that to you, were you like, oh my gosh, what an incredible moment of my career. You know, I'm going to get, this is so awesome. Maybe you're going and bragging to your friends, guys, can you check this out? I just got a promotion. Or was it more like, why are you choosing me? What was your feeling when you got that call? I think it was the, the line of Jesus at the crucifixion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And really, I didn't know why the bishop was selecting me. But the church does say that. So he's he's making a joke that basically he's, suffering to actually be someone who has to serve God's people in this capacity. <laughs> it was a curse. Right. Yeah, it was a curse upon his life. And and apparently people find that amusing. And apparently that's the common sentiment held by these priests. He was basically making it sound like nobody wants this job. Right, right. Nobody wants this job, you know. And yeah. he's also making it like a very esoteric position when Jesus said clearly Anyone who believes will cast out demons. So, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Priest should be known for his holiness and piety. He should have some years of priesthood behind him. So a newly ordained priest should not have the ministry. It should be a priest who is pretty comfortable in his priestly identity. Wait, by the way, which churches practice exorcism? Is it just the Catholic Church or are other, do other religions also practice exorcism? Exorcism can be found in just about every faith tradition, whether Christian or non-Christian. The belief in the reality of evil probably the Catholic Church, because it's a, it's, a, it's a liturgical rite for us, so we have a prescribed way of doing it. 
So it's probably that most people... Notice he's not pointing out that the only name these demons submit to is the name of Jesus. He's basically saying, this is done in, in every faith. You know, the Muslims do it. They call the demons jinns, and they do these bootleg exorcisms where demons manifest, but no one actually expels them. Mm -hmm. And many other religions, like Hindus, conjure up demons. They call it exorcisms, but really, it's just demons manifesting, but they're not coming out of that person's flesh. Right. So he didn't even bother to say that there's no other way that this could take place but by the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He basically just like a typical universalist, uh, one world religion Catholic, mm -hmm. gave every other faith the credit that this could actually be done. Right. By like a Hindu. Yeah. We'll have the concept that Catholics primarily do this, but I always say that the Catholic Church doesn't have a monopoly on the practice. But perhaps what the church does is more widely known by many people. But it's more, more Catholic. So the Catholic Church doesn't have a monopoly. They're competing with Muslims and Hindus in this exorcism game. Yep. Very interesting. I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. And it mm -hmm. says uh, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Lutheran churches, uh, Church of Latter-day Saints. You know, uh, m but majority of them is Catholic Church, right? If you were to think about exorcisms. Am I wrong? I may be wrong on this. No, I think you're right. Because, okay. you know, I currently get about a... 70 people contacting me every week from literally all over the world. What a joke. No, the Catholic Church is not the majority doing exorcisms. It would be evangelical Christians spread throughout other denominations, I mean, not the Catholic Church. Some of the greatest mockery I've seen of deliverance ministry has come from Catholics. Right, and all the movies and the clown show that comes with it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and if he thinks that the deliverance that these other churches are doing is true, that just shows you how he has absolutely no clue what true deliverance is. Of course. You know? but any other deliverance, they're putting the demons into you every time. Yep. Whether knowingly or unknowingly. Mm -hmm. And about half of them are Catholic and the other half are either mm -hmm. other Christian faith traditions or other world religions or no faith background whatsoever. So I think people have the mentality that if you're dealing with no faith background, casting out demons, I have n I've yet to see that. The demonic, the Catholic Church, as the ministry of charity, would help anybody who finds themselves in this situation. When you get these calls, what do these calls sound like? I've heard just about everything you can imagine. People that you know. Give us from the basic one to the ones where this person needs help. We have to talk to this person. There's a lot of people who believe that maybe somebody put a curse on them. One of the primary things I try to do is if it's truly something demonic, then what was the entry point for the demonic into this person's life? The average person doesn't really have to worry about extraordinary de demonic activity. If one is living their life the way that they should, they're pretty much safeguarded. But if somebody does something that could open up an entry point to the demonic in their life, they can begin experiencing all kinds of problems. So I try. That's not even biblical. That's not nope. even biblical at all. We're all born in sin. There were people in the Bible that were tormented by devils that were people's children that didn't even get into anything yet, like the Canaanite woman's daughter. Amen. What did she do? She was probably just being a normal little girl. Yup. Guys, anyone who wants to pretend like the only people that are vexed with demons is someone that picked up a Ouija board and like spilled chicken blood and like poured it on their head is a complete imbecile and has no clue of the depth of the range and the ability that Satan has over mankind and their flesh. Right, and also, what was we that? see clearly those who do the right thing are the ones that get the most deliverance. So it's the complete opposite of what he's saying. Right. I mean, the person that's not doing the right thing, they need deliverance and they still have demons, but the demons are burrowed down in their personality so deep, amalgamized with who they are, They've not yet acknowledged that the demons are part of their personality and inside of them. So you never see outward manifestations of the demon. The demon only expresses itself by the person carrying out certain character traits, such as lying, manipulation, selfishness, thieving, you know, obviously drug use and all the other stuff, of course, but even the subtle things. Powerful demons will remain lodged deep in someone's personality, in their body, carrying out basic sins, even jealousy or gossip, things like that. Good point. What did somebody do or what did somebody try to do to them 
that brought about the demonic activity in their life. When you say entry point, do you mean physical entry point? Like how does the a demon enter someone's body or do you mean more uh, esoterically? How do you mean? How, how they initially made the connection with the demonic, like did somebody dabble in magic and witchcraft and those types of things. Okay. And then so the demonic would look for an opportunity to literally connect with that individual in order to try to destroy their life. And then so porno, I guess, doesn't bring it in. Drunkenness, drug addiction, right? Only the occult brings them in, according to this guy. How does the demon enter the body? Like through their mouth, through their face, through their body, through their heart, through their soul? How does it actually happen? Not through their soul, because the soul always remains free. Whenever it's a question of demonic possession, it's always physical in nature. So the devil would take control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its own. So using the person's mouth to speak, their ears to hear, their eyes to see. And any time a demon possesses somebody, one should always make the distinction between that person as an individual and now the identity of the demon that is now acting through that person's body. What, what I was going to say, one could get... I would disagree with that. I would say that the demons are attached to the soul because the life of the body is in the blood. And I believe the soul is a big part of that life force that's in a human being, but this, it's the spirit that the demon doesn't attach itself to. The spirit belongs to the Lord. As you get more demonized, your personality becomes one with that demon. And you're, that's your personality in the end. Right, right. Most people don't know which elements of their personality are carried out by demons inside their body until they actually get revelation from God that their actions are sinful and repent of them. And then the demon begins to surface, and then you will begin to see outward manifestations and a more extreme contrast between the demon's personality and your own until the demon comes out, and then that element of your personality no longer is vexing you anymore of heady in the topic. St. Thomas Aquinas would always say that it isn't literally that a demon is inside of somebody, it's that the demon is controlling that person. Yeah, Adam, most of the time you'll find in the uh, in the Christian faiths, I'm a born-again Christian, non-denominational, um, so you understand the perspective of what I share here today. And it's referred to as ground taken and ground canceled. And so what ground has been given in the spiritual life of the person that that demon uses as the foothold for spiritualization and um, and demonization. Uh, I, I kind of draw the line, as many Christian faiths do, as you know, about the, you know, uh, the oppression versus occupation line, you know. And so um, we see it as demonization and heavy oppression using that ground that that person has, you know, um, consequentially, you know, opened themselves up to. And that ground has to be... Was that a statement or a question? I'm curious. Are no, you... that was a statement oh, to okay, Adam because he asked a question, does it enter through your yeah. mouth or anything like this? And I also... Provided a sidebar so that, you know, Father understands my perspective. I got you. Perfect. So, so, by the way, if you're listening to this, I'm curious. Do you believe in, in this or do you not believe in this? Just comment below. I'm just curious to know where the audience is at. If you say, Pat, I, I do believe in this, give it a thumbs up. If you don't believe in it, put a thumbs down. Tyler, so, can we do a poll? Is that possible? Put a poll let's up get so that we can see that. Yeah, I'm actually curious. So, so let's, continue. let's continue with this part. So, um, when, you, when you do go to school, because you wrote a book about this. I think there's a book about it, right? So, the book's name is, uh, uh, the, uh, it's called Exorcism, The Battle Against Satan and His Demons. Uh, is a book that you wrote. And in the book, you talk about a few different things, how the church selects and trains priests uh, for the ministry of exorcism, where and how the devil operates in the world, and what scripture had to say about it. Why is it vital for Catholics to live in a vibrant uh, life of faith? What do you believe? What do you do if, what to do if you suspect the presence of demonic in your life or in others? And uh, to fend off spiritual attack and build a stronger relationship with God. Okay, so let's talk about you. So when, when, the, when the priest you spoke to said, I want to appoint you to do this and we have to send you back to Rome to go get trained and come back, what did the training entail? And how long was it? So I stayed in Rome for three months in the early part of 2006. Really, the church says the best way to learn it is through the apprenticeship model, to find a more seasoned exorcist and then to work under him. It's easy to pick up books and learn what the church believes and teaches about the reality of evil, but the church wants its exorcist to have kind of literally on-the-ground training. It's kind of like a doctor who has to do kind of an intern before one is sent out and begins doing it on their own. So the internship, when I was in Rome, I was able to connect with the Franciscan priest who had been an exorcist for 25 years. Then he permitted me to sit in on 40 exorcisms that he performed during the time that I was there. And then that allowed me to learn firsthand the ministry of the church for those who were up against the forces of evil and were seeking help. What was the most extreme one you witnessed out of the 40? Because <laughs> of course you get that question all the time. There are a few that stand out. You know, obviously the very first one, you know, I'm talking with a, uh, an elderly lady and her husband. 
and she's t- explaining to me why she believes that she's possessed. And, you know, I, I just, the three of us are in the room where we're having a conversation and I'm watching Father Carmine, the priest who trained me, and he walks into the room and he puts a roll of paper towels on the table and he walks back out and he comes back in and ties a plastic grocery bag onto the wall radiator. Mm. He walks back out again and he comes in and this time he has a purple stole, which is a piece of purple cloth that a priest will drape around his neck as a sign of his priestly office. He has the rite of exorcism in his hand and he immediately takes holy water and he blesses this little elderly lady. As soon as the drops of water hit her, the demon manifested. Her eyes rolled in the back of her head. She began foaming at the mouth, growling and snarling and throwing out all kinds of blasphemies. Such as? You know, she was insulting God. She was insulting me and Father Carmine and just about anyone. Basically doing anything as a way to disrupt this particular prayer of the church. Okay, that account is is normal. Of course, that that's what you see many times when demons manifest. You said so you've seen many. So that was the first one you saw. Was there anything that was more extreme than her? Absolutely. Uh, the one that really stands out the most was uh, during an exorcism when the demon manifested and the person's body began to levitate. You saw somebody's body levitate. I saw a person levitate during an exorcism. How, how much was the levitation? The person rose about a foot out of the chair they were in because I'm looking at this in disbelief. And Father Carmine is praying the rite of the church, the prayers, and he's glancing over and looking, and he looks back at his book. He looks back at the person. He looks back at his book. Then he takes his hand, puts it on the head of the person, and pushes him back down into the chair without ever pausing for one, even one That's very possible, but I find it funny that the most I've ever seen someone lifted off a chair, they were they came up off the chair, but it was no foot. It was no bizarre-looking you know, satanic ritual-like situation. Of course, the force of the demons when they're coming out will pull the person's flesh up when they're coming up out of a person. But this whole situation where the person kind of just levitates mid-deliverance session and floats there, this is horror movie garbage that you are likely to never see if you did deliverance for 30 years all day, every day with thousands of people. What do you think about that, Ben? The fact that these Catholics, every story is a levitation. No. It's always a levitation of one foot. It's almost they're like they want to scare people away from this altogether. They're trying to make it seem like this is only for the worst cases ever. That's always been the goal. Same with horror movies. And it's weird how this guy was there with that priest for like two months. And he saw this. And you've been doing this 10 years. You've never seen anything like it, right? I've seen you things know. close. Like I've seen people lifted up, but like levitated a foot. Like the way they're articulating it is almost like they want you to think of like these movies you see where a person's just laying sideways, levitated horizontally up into the air. Like I've seen people on chairs being pulled up out of the chair to the point where they're a foot off the chair and just floating there. No. Not, I mean, why would they? Ha- why would the devil have that kind of power in the presence of saints? Now, when I was involved in the occult, I was levitated off my bed, a, a, a good ways, a foot up, right? But that's when there was no presence of God there, and I'm worshiping demons or or, or doing that kind of stuff. Like to see that in a Christian church, just seems kind of like. It's like nothing I've ever seen. Like nothing I've ever seen, you know? Uh, in the prayer. Was any of that caught on camera? The church does not videotape. Oftentimes, mm, people... How convenient, Father. <laughs> but let me, let me ask this question. But the reason the church does that is mm-hmm. to protect the identity of the individual. Mm. So okay. obviously at this point... that, that's not biblical. The Bible says, let your light shine before men and glorify God. And Jesus did not cast out demons in secret. He did it out in front of everybody. So what he just said is not biblical. Notice they don't have the video of it. They're asking, where's the video of this levitation that you're talking about? Demons aren't stupid anyway. No one's going to get levitated on camera in front of everybody. Every video you see online of people levitating is all fake stuff. It's all bogus. I don't believe in this stuff a lot. I am very skeptical. When When I was involved in the occult, before I got saved... Demons were moving things around my house. I would see it right in front of me. And the second I pulled out a camera, nothing moved. They're not going to get caught on camera moving things around. This is something that 
God allows the devil to do to either torment somebody for his own reasons or to bring someone to repentance. He lets the devil run amok in their house. He's not looking for someone to get like clear video footage of this so everyone believes by the testimony of a demon levitating a chair in a house or something. This is something carried out by the Most High God's deterministic will in a person's life. It's not for movie land, so... To put it out there, and and I'd, I'd like to right. see what the audience but has. That's, but the mixture yeah. of who we have today is yeah. perfect of where... I think it's healthy to be skeptical. So, you know, if I, if I go to a David Copperfield show and I kind of see, you know, what yep. the works he's doing, I look up, I see the strings, I'm like, that's pretty cool how they're doing it. But in this setting, when that happened, how many people were in the room when you saw this? It was uh, me, another priest, Father Carmen A., the individual and a family member that was with him. So, so five, five of you. Five of us. So it's not, so, so here's the part. Let's mm -hmm. play, let's play a, a skeptic, but let's also play, why would he say this? So when you look at him, he doesn't look like something, like I watch his interviews. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, there is, what is, like yesterday, the biggest thing was, what's the motive? Like when I watch Bob Larson, I'm not going to lie, I don't know how you feel about Bob Larson. You look like you have some opinions on Bob Larson or no. <laughs> we all do. Okay, so I'd be curious to know, get your feedback on Bob Larson. And when Bob I, Larson is who exactly? He's a fa famous exorcist. Do you know who Bob with Larson the daughters? is? With the daughters? Yeah, yeah. Bob Larson's the guy with the daughters. This, okay. this is Bob Larson. So yeah, I've seen him. A yeah. guy like him is why nobody would believe in exorcism. Okay. Yeah. Because this is the part where it's the flamboyant, the showmanship, the you know all this stuff. I have a hard time. You may. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on Bob Larson before I even go further? Well, rather than being critical of someone else, I would tend to be want to be more positive about what I believe exorcism is. Because we talked about skepticism. An exorcist is trained to be a skeptic. I should be the very last person in the room to believe that somebody is truly dealing with extraordinary demonic activity. Every other possible explanation needs to be exalted. He should what? be the last person to actually believe that the person's dealing with a demon because he's an exorcist. That's stupid. Does that make any sense at all? None at all. So he, like, out of all people in a room, if someone's claiming, hey, I'm tormented at night, weird dreams, mm -hmm. he should be the last guy in the room to actually give heed to what they're saying. Right. He's supposed to have the worst discernment out of everybody, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah anyone who has any real experience battling into supernatural, casting out demons, in my experience from what I've seen, is it's like, it's a demon, that's the first go-to. It's like, this is, this is probably right. demonic. And then, you know, you go through whatever else. But, yeah, you don't think it's the last thing that it could be. Right. It's like an act he's putting on to seem like a rational guy, you know, right. for the people yeah. watching. I it's mean, also him teaching people to dismiss people that have these issues quickly. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, so they can't get help because these demons know exactly what they're doing. These Catholics, you know. Yeah, nah, I mean, he's been doing this since the beginning. That's ex exactly what he was doing when he mentioned other faiths that also have experience with coming against demons, right? It's He's trying to, look, I'm just like you. A lot of people do this. Everybody's got, you know, in on this in some way or form. It's not that weird. Yeah, yet I got my costume on and I'm here. I do it full time, but mm -hmm. it's kind of weird. It's kind of... Something you should be skeptical of, but it's my full-time job, by the way. Yeah, as a Catholic yeah. priest, I didn't even really want to do it. I got mm. chosen to do it. It's that whole attitude, like, you know. It, it's, it's designed to make people think this is ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Like, any logical person, someone who's never even read the Bible, is going to listen to this guy's logic and the way he reasons and his the things that are coming out of his mouth and be like, this is just stupid. Right. Yeah. Oh, I haven't level levitated off of a chair, so I'm good. I don't have a demon. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the approach the Catholic Church takes. That's why even in the United States, we have a protocol that we follow. And step number one of the protocol is for the person to have a psychiatric evaluation. Step two is to have a physical examination because the church wants experts in the mental. Yeah, because Jesus did that, right? Just like Jesus did. You know, he was like, he was like, Peter. Can we get the psych evaluation going on this freak over here? Yeah. We got to make sure they're not really demonized. Yeah. Could you cough for me, please? Yeah. We have no spiritual discernment, so we have to run some tests on you that have been invest invented in the last 50 years. That's why they got Luke yeah. on board. You know, they needed a doctor first. <laughs> He's the one that did the physical exam. They yeah. was like, all right, Jesus, yeah. bring it in. Let's try yeah. your thing. 
mental health field and in the medical sciences to weigh in and wait, Chris, on what is happening. Or what, what, are they, has what do they do when they do the psych exam and it comes out that they got big problems? So they just like, oh, you're screwed. Like, <laughs> and that's it. Or yeah, mm -hmm. they're like, God <laughs> can't fix this. Take Prozac. Bye. <laughs> That's what they, when I got, when I got saved and I was demon possessed and I went to the Catholic church in Saddle River, New Jersey, mm -hmm. they just told me I was crazy. They didn't even send me to a psychiatrist to get a legit evaluation or anything. They were, when I told them what was happening in my house, they were like, are you mentally ill, son? Right. My dear son of God, are you, are you mentally disturbed? And I was like, don't you believe like in the devil? <laughs> and they were like, yes, yes, but many things are psychosomatic events, and you were on drugs, and you've done many things, and you could have damaged your brain. Mm. It's so funny how everyone that damages their brain with drugs ends up seeing Satan's demons. Like, it's, right. not, it's not Big Bird, it's not like Barney the Dinosaur that you mm. see jumping around. You always see Satan's demons, I wonder why. Right, and I just thought of something... Anyone who watches this, the first thing they're going to do now when they can, if they think, oh, I might have a demon, is they're going to go to a, a psychiatrist to get an evaluation. Yeah. And then boom. And again. guess where you end up if you're suffering with that problem on drugs in a psych ward with them drugging the daylights out of you where you can never come out of it. Right. And believes this happening in their life. I will say, because I am publicly known as an exorcist, I receive the high volume of people who reach out to me but the majority of the people who reach out to me have already self-diagnosed. And any exorcist will tell you that when somebody has self-diagnosed, 99% of the time, it's not something demonic. 99% of the time, it's not something that was more like DID or it's, it's something else. That so someone who thinks that, that demons are in them, 99% of the time, it's not demonic. 99%. And in my experience, 100% of the time, it is demonic. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Because you have to think, a person naturally doesn't want it to be demons. Of course not. Right? You don't want to believe that you have some kind of evil spirit living in your flesh that's causing you to have wicked thoughts or, you know, creating wicked impulses within you. So if you can get to the point where you can look in the mirror and be like, there is something seriously wrong on a spiritual level here. I need to call somebody for help. The fact that you would think, 99 out of 100 times people are overreacting or, or misled is ridiculous. Yeah, and the great part is what people will say is, Chris, you just want everyone to believe they have demons so they have to come to you. No, I don't want anyone coming to me, and I don't want to have to deal with demons myself. Mm -hmm. And 9 out of 10 people I pray for, maybe 19 out of 20, never support my ministry at all. They take the prayer, they take the knowledge, and they never give us a dollar. And they ride off into the sunset, and we don't say peep about it. And the only reason I'm mentioning I'm mentioning it now is to refute anyone who's going to try and take that angle on what we're trying to articulate here. Like, as if we want to say everyone has demons because we're lining our pockets with people calling here for deliverance. We don't believe in charging for deliverance at all. Therefore, anyone who ever gave, they gave on their own uh, conscience with the, between them and God. Most of the time, it's it's small dollars, five, ten dollars. The rare person gives thousands of dollars, and that's how you keep the whole thing moving. But the point I'm making is, why would we be preaching this if we got to go through 20, 30 people before someone even supports the ministry for free if it wasn't true? Why would we be, what's the motive? Horrible business model. It's the worst business model ever. If, the, if we're just making this up just to go through 20, 30 people in the hopes that one person gives to the ministry so we can actually keep the lights on and keep going. And you know what? Most of us don't even care if the people do that. If God makes it where no one gives, we'll just go work with our hands somewhere. That's way more stress-free than dealing with demons and other people's problems all day. Oh, yeah. Way less stressful. Right, or we could be like Bob Larson and charge like 500 bucks for an hour of deliverance, you know? Exactly. And that's, and you know, that's why they always go to him as the charlatan, because he's got the gimmicks, he's got the cross out, flinging holy water on people, like a whack job, 
making it all all these uh big huge cinematic uh confrontations where he's acting like it's a, a big big situation you know i used to do that stuff when i first got saved like i used to get all amped up when i was confronting evil spirits now i'll dude i'll be eating like a bowl of cornflakes while i'm casting out demons like i don't want to raise my voice i don't have the energy to do that anymore you know so they choose these guys like that are like showmen like bob larson and they make a mockery of the whole thing and then they bring in this little demonic false exorcist from the catholic church with his with his little costume on to talk all this foolish garbage that 99 percent of the time it's not even a demon when someone comes to their church complaining about demons he's basically saying anyone who complains about demons is a whack job it's all in their head 99 percent so if a million people run to the Catholic Church with, with problems, like spiritual issues, demonic issues, torment at night, things scratching them in the bed, you know, dreams that never end, that cycle where you're waking up like it's a Freddy Krueger movie, they just say, this is, this is not demons. Mm-hmm. You're, not in the, you're, you're not in the 1% of people who actually need an exorcism. When, in what other area of life, by the way, is that ever true? Like, a guy thinks his wife is cheating on him. A guy thinks someone's stealing money from him. A right. guy thinks he's sick. He has a stomach problem or some kind of health issue. In what other area of life is it like 99% of the time your right. gut's wrong? In what area is it even 50%? None. I've that never seen crazy. that. <laughs> it's almost like 1% of the time you might be wrong when your gut's telling you something. Right. You know? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Okay. When someone self-diagnoses, meaning they think that they are possessed by a demon, ninety-nine yeah. percent of the time, it's not accurate. Correect. Okay. So they're they're calling me and saying, what a joke. "I'm possessed, and I need an right. exorcism." And my response would be, <laughs> "No, you're not. We make." How is that? How is that even logical? Yeah. What is actually wrong with them at that point? Did he just they're say schizophrenic? His they're bipolar. They're no, on drugs. They're depression. What's the what's no, the? Not, yeah. He just said he said his immediate response before that he said that's before they even do the psych evaluation, mm-hmm. right? Is no, you're not. That's his immediate and his no, you're mind. Not. We may response. get to that point, yeah. but we have. Wait, let's see. Time there, it's not accurate. Correct. Okay. So they're they're calling me and saying I'm possessed and I need an right. exorcism, and my response would be, No, you're not. We may get to that point, <laughs> yeah. but we have to look at. <laughs> so he that? he tells them they're not before he even has time to do the psych evaluation. Yeah. So now the truth is coming out on this fraud. Mm-hmm. We don't want to take the time to do an exorcism. We don't want to be bothered by you. Get out of here, you nutbag. You're not Did demonized. Did you hear him, Chris? He was like, my response is, now you're not. We might get to that point. So he literally admits yeah. that he lies. Yeah, he just admitted he's a liar. Because you don't get to that point. Because obviously the person would have had the demon from the moment they called in. If they ended up getting to the point where they figured out the person had a demon. Mm-hmm. Wow. Really wrong with them at that point. They're schizophrenic. Man, the, you Catholics, you got to find smarter people than this to be your circus clowns. <laughs> Really? They're bipolar, they're on drugs, they're depression. What's the, what's the... It could be all of those, and that's okay. why it has to be investigated, because I would be the first one to say the church would do greater harm to, uh, to someone if she labels that person as being possessed, and that mm-hmm. label prevents the person from getting the true help that they need. So there may be other people that are exorcists that may be too quick to believe that somebody is possessed. But again, I think that would do greater harm if it prevents them from going and getting help from the psychiatrist or their family doctor. Because the overriding goal should be to get help in, for the person who is suffering, whether that be due to spiritual, physical, or mental problems that they're having in their life. Mm-hmm. I, don't do wanna, you, I don't wanna hover over this. I think Tom wants to say something, then I wanna go back the to ultimate the ultimate goal, sir, should be to find the truth and deal with the devil. Fitting in Bob Larson, go ahead. Because even you, drugs is sorcery, brings in devils. So even if they're on drugs or they got a mental disorder, schizophrenia, all that stuff is caused by demons. Also conduct a spiritual inventory, like take them to Galatians and go through the list of things. So you're satisfied that there's a psychiatric evaluation, which is prudent, a physical evaluation, looking for signs of drug use and other things that are very obvious in the physical realm, you know. And then do you take them to a spiritual inventory? Yes, so there is that step three of the protocol. There is an intake questionnaire that was, you know, the Vatican has a course on exorcism every year. And a part of that, they help put together an intake questionnaire trying to determine if this truly is something demonic then what opened the doorway for that into the person's life? And then it's not only then identifying 
It's also about helping the person resume their spiritual life or to start a spiritual life for the You don't always need to find why a demon gained access to someone's life to get demons out of people. The person repents of the natures that the demon is carrying out, and you cast it out. That's a valid way to get them out. Not saying that's going to be every time. Sometimes it's it's uh, a value to find out how it got in, what its name is, then quickly get it out. But these guys act like the only way you could conduct an exorcism is to find out which side of the family a demon came down. It's absolutely <laughs> moronic. And when I right. first got into this, like I was more going at that angle because a lot of other people seemed to think it was really valuable. But the longer I do this, the less valuable what your mommy and daddy did and who put a curse on you starts to become. It matters what you're ready to let go of, and are you fulfilling your calling, and are you serving the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what matters. And if you're doing that, if you fulfill your calling, and you honor God, and you repent, and you pass down imaginations, don't let any wicked thoughts reign in your mind, if you do that, your deliverance goes on a deterministic autopilot, where you're just watching the show as God cleans you out year by year. You don't need to worry about lucky charms in the cabinet. You don't need to worry about a witchcraft item that someone might have dropped uh, under your bumper of your car to curse you. You don't need to worry about it. Serve God. The Bible says a curse without cause cannot land. I'll say that yep. again. A curse without cause cannot land. You can curse a real believer all day. Nothing's landing if the guy's walking in the truth following God. Absolutely. And what would Jesus, what would this guy do if the Gadarene demoniac came up to him? Would he be like, well, we need to go through the protocol first, sir. Let's start with the psychiatrist. Let's find out how he came in. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's ridiculous. Time. So it's not just a matter of casting demons out. Mm -hmm. God has to be invited in. And I would say that in the role of an exorcist, the primary focus is not really on what the devil is doing in a person's life, but what God wants to do in that person's life. And there are four different types of uh, things that the church looks for that would validate that perhaps this truly is something demonic. Number one would be the ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, having superhuman strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual, having elevated perception, knowledge about things that the person should not otherwise know. And then four, probably the one that most people are familiar with, an aversion to anything of a sacred nature, such as having scripture read in front of them, being mm -hmm. blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix, the things that people probably are familiar with simply by watching movies and whatnot on exorcism. So, you so see what he's doing, Chris? Superpower, a language he's trying to, he's bringing up the most rare things that could occur in a demonic deliverance and making it seem like you have to have these things happen yeah. to you. When in reality, it's like you're watching porno. You got tons of demons. Yeah. You know? He's basically saying if a guy doesn't speak fluent Chinese, <laughs> who, if he's an American that never heard the language, it's not a demon. You got to see some like extraordinary exploits to believe it's actually a demon. And the last one he said was, oh, you can't endure hearing scripture read to you. What? So what that does is completely eliminate every church going Christian, every Christian that goes to church on a Sunday or a Saturday and listens to the pastor read the Bible and doesn't start convulsing is like, oh. I can listen to scripture just fine. So right. that must mean I don't have a demon. Right. Should not speak. Access to information. I must have been really possessed by their standard then. Mm -hmm. But they threw me out, said I wasn't possessed. But the funny thing is, when I walked into a real church, I couldn't even walk through the doors without manifesting. So it's interesting I meet his criteria for being a demoniac. Mm -hmm. But yet when I actually went to the Catholic church, they told me I was a mental patient. And they, they, they wanted me out. Yeah, clearly they're not united in yeah. terms of their approach or their beliefs where this is concerned. Clearly the goal is always to like get the person out of your face and send them away. Mm -hmm. You know, making them think they're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. That they yep. normally shouldn't have. And then the fourth one is what the priest does or them, like how they respond to no, holy them. water. Uh, aversion to anything right. spiritual. Um, in the Christian church, and um, are you familiar with Dr. Carl Payne? 
No, I'm not. No. You know, Paul Payne wrote a, a, a wonderful book on uh, spiritual warfare from non-denominational Christian perspective. So it doesn't contain anything like from the Presbyterian or the Southern Baptist Convention. It's just non-denominational Bible interpretation. And one of the things he pointed out was that something as simple as reading 1 John 4 and saying, you know, Every, um, this is how you recognize the spirit of God. You know, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus Christ is not. And people have a strong resistance to that. The, those particular verses that are, that are calling on that with the power. And, you know, when... By the way, this is bogus too. Demons will acknowledge who Jesus is. When that verse says, acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh, it means you live in that and walk in it and follow him. Doesn't mean the demon won't say Jesus is Lord or Jesus came in the... Demons will say that. If you torture a demon under the power of God, demons will acknowledge who he is. So these people who use that verse to basically say, I'm going to test this spirit by asking it if Jesus came in the flesh. A demon will say, yes, he came in the flesh. The Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. So when it says the spirit that, that won't acknowledge that is not of God, it means a spirit that doesn't walk in his suffering. That's what it means to acknowledge he came into in, in the flesh. To know it, to have the mental knowledge of it, to accept it into your heart, and to follow him. That is fully acknowledging it. Let's not forget also, I can't remember where it was. I think it was in Luke where the demon looked at Jesus and said, you are the son of the most high God. Right. Right. And so literally we have Bible evidence of a demon acknowledging Jesus as Lord and the son of the most high God. Right. And clearly the demon knew he was in the flesh because he was standing there in a physical body. Mm -hmm. Helping people with demonization. Um, it's exactly as you say. And, but you can avoid, you can avoid the sensational reaction of them by setting ground rules and, Asking for the, the covering of the Holy Spirit. Um, have you ever witnessed this before? I've not witnessed this before, but I've talked to three people. Here's that... like his low key correction of the Catholic guy who's talking about levitation and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's like, you can stop the manifestation. So now he's going off the road on the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. We either got to have a person levitating off the table mm -hmm. or we got to stop all manifestation. Right. Neither are true. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to do mess with either. You pray and God does what he does. Mm -hmm. If it's a big outburst of a demonic manifestation, you don't say, Lord, block the manifestation so our holy, precious eyes can't see anything vulgar or filthy. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that in the Bible. Right. You pray, whatever, come, whatever needs to happen for that person to wiggle out of that situation, for that demon to come out of that person, I should say, is, is, needs to happen. Let it run its course until it, unless it's completely endangering people in the church or becoming showmanship, or you could tell the person just likes attention. Other than that, you let the person manifest, you let the demon come out. Because if you quench the manifestation, you can quench the, 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 the actual deliverance. Because demons throw a fit before they come out, and that's biblical that they rip and tear. So if you sit there saying, We don't want you to come up. Well, they need to come up. They need to surface to come out of the person. So why would you ever stop that either? That's just as dumb as the view of the Catholic priest, which is that we see people levitating off the table, one foot, mid-deliverance. <laughs> no, that's satanic ritual stuff where demons have that kind of power. If the demons have the power to float somebody in the air right in front of you while you're praying then you don't have a lot of anointing from the Most High God to quench that ability for those demons to move a physical object to that degree. That, um, Carl have, you, have you ever had anybody in your life, where, and this goes to all of the time, mm -hmm. this goes to you and to you, have you guys ever seen anybody in your life where you said this person may be possessed? Yeah, absolutely. You've had somebody? Yes, absolutely. And you witnessed it like you, you knew this person, or was it a person that person knew? It was my friend's mom, and, and I, I witnessed her in a... And she was not drugged. She was in hospice, but she was not being given morphine or anything of the of the sort. So she was unmedicated. Have you witnessed anybody? Yeah, and it just turns out that they were on bath salts. Okay, how about yourself? No, no, you never have. Okay, no. so so I have witnessed a close relative that would say, "I put a curse on that person." Okay, mm. I put a curse on that person, and watch what's going to happen to that person. And I've seen a person behavior 
act in a weird way. But my, my opinion on that is a completely different thing, which we'll get into here in a minute. I want to go back to this. So people like Bob Larson are, are who pushes me away from believing any of this stuff is real, and they're using it to monetize and sensationalize and get eyeballs. People like you don't do that to me because there is no motive for you to do this. Why would you do this? I don't sit there and say, your motivation is that. It, Why do you His say motivation is probably little access to little boys. No motive, though. But for him? Right. For him? I don't, so, so, okay, let's go through the motives of life. What are the main motives of life or why somebody would deceive you? Why somebody would deceive you? Money is number one. Mm -hmm. What else? What's another motive? Status. Status, somebody to have sex with you, right? To kind of like impress you where you're like, hey, oh my gosh, and then boom, mm -hmm. take advantage of you. Okay, what else is it? What else is a motive? Recognition. Recognition, recognition, fine, but that's still, okay, what else would it be? What else would it be? So what, what else would the motive be here? That's the part, even... Something yeah. bigger than themselves, i.e. the Catholic Church. I mean, you got a lot to answer to if you're... I do. If you so, got to answer to the church, I'm not saying anything about the Father, but... You know, there's a hierarchy up there. By the way, he's right. Bob Larson should not be charging for deliverance. It's wicked. Just just let, let that be known right now. I, that part I understand. That part I understand, and we'll get to that here in a minute. But let's go back to it. So when you saw this person levitate a foot, and there's only five of you in the room, what's your initial reaction? What's your first reaction? Disbelief. Disbelief. That well, was my initial reaction. Why is it disbelief? Yeah. That's what you guys believe, that people levitate, you know. Mm-hmm. Why would you even go into that it, that field mm -hmm. of work to be a deliverance worker for the Catholic Church if you didn't believe that that stuff like that was possible? I mean, it should be the most faith affirming thing, right? To literally see someone levitating off of the table, it shouldn't be. This isn't happening. It's at least the faith of a faith affirming thing that the devil exists. You right. Know? Exactly. It should be a very demoralizing thing that you have authority over him if someone's just floating horizontally through your room of your church or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then I quickly focused on what the priest who was training me was doing because he wasn't focused on the theatrics of the demonic, if you will. He was staying focused on the prayer of the church, which is why he was able to simply reach over, put his hand on the head of the person, put him back, push him back down into the chair. Why would he push him down? If someone's going to levitate, I'd like to see how high they go up. Why, why clip the angel's wings, so to speak? Let them, let's see how high they can go up. You're up a foot? Yeah, but let's stay serious here. For yeah, but I'm, not, I'm being actually very serious. Lower, if someone lower, is full on levitating. Look at super loud, though. If someone is, yeah. is full on levitating, let them levitate. Yeah, I mean, maybe, so okay. So, but the reason I think that, that he did not let him do that, because that allows the demonic to be in charge of the prayer that's taking place. And again, the focus should always be on what God is doing. Mm -hmm. Because the demonic obviously would want to disrupt the prayer because it wants to maintain its connection or hold on the life of this individual. Right. And what the priest is doing, invoking the power and the authority of God. And that's the other important thing to make point out. I don't have any special powers and abilities. If people are relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if people are relying on the power and the authority that Christ has given to the church, that's the proper mentality to have. So it's not about me and any power that I yeah. have. Even the priest who trained me told me, he said, if you're ever doing an exorcism for a, and even for a brief moment, think, wow, look at what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. He said, you've just walked on unholy ground. That's true. That's very true what he just said. Exactly. That's the... Uh, Gotta give him credit when they say something right. It's the story of the seven sons of Sceva. Yeah. The seven sons of Sceva were going out attempted, and they were doing minor minor illness healings, correct, um, by invoking the name of Jesus Christ until they came up to a truly oppressed person and the person says, Jesus, I know, and says, and Paul, I've heard of, but who are you? Remember that? Yep. And the individual beat these people um, individually. And, and Paul pointed out, he said, look, you know, these people were not authentic. This is a sham. And it's, it's like Benny Hinn, a faith healer with a toupee. Explain and that. that's kind of like what Bob Larson seems like to be. And, and so, so here's, here's where I go with this. You, you know the, the, the saying, the second is the, the, the quote by Charles uh, Baudelaire. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know how to pronounce the guy's last name. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then uh, Ken. Usual suspects. Yeah, exactly. Ken Ami says the second greatest trick the well, devil. Well, it sounds like that that plan is being worked through this guy believing 99% of people that say they have demons are lying and they're, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's right. That's literally the devil convincing the world through the Catholic Church that he's not there and you don't need to deal with them. So the, the other thing is that, that the. the uh, what do you call it? Uh, quote I read in a book called, De um, what's the book's name? The Outwitting the Devil. I don't know if you've ever mm. read the book Outwitting the Devil. It's a form of screw tape letters mm. by C.S. Lewis. It's some kind of a book like that. And in this book, it says, you know, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is convincing you that he existed. 
Okay. So when you when you hear, and you know what the difference is, obviously the difference between, so the argument one side is what? Hey, he doesn't exist. Dude, just go do whatever you want to do. Just live your life and be free and have, you know, that whole thing. Have fun. Who cares? You only got one life, you know. What is that one uh, acronym? YOLO. Uh, YOLO. Hey, you only live once and go do whatever you want to do. That's okay. <laughs> Great. But in a way, the other quote says, live as, as if, you know, you know, the greatest trick he ever pulled is to convince you that he exists. He doesn't exist. It's just a pigment of your imagination. You, it's in your thoughts. It's your imagination. When you hear those two arguments, what's, what do you say to that? Well, it sounds like the, the devil wants to be the one that dictates everything. And I think there's too much focus on, on the devil. There's too much focus on the devil? Absolutely. <laughs> do you think one has to, if, you, if one believes in God, do they automatically have to believe there's a, there's a devil? There's a song that I'm thinking of, what is it, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, 1969. I swear there ain't no heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell is that oftentimes people won't believe in God, but then there's that fear of kind of the unknown, and the demonic can be that fear of the unknown, and that's where the devil can try to get into people's heads and whatnot. Is there an official stance from the Catholic Church? The interesting thing is what Satan's actually doing is he's going with the first one, convincing the world that he doesn't exist, so you live like you want to live. But once times get so wicked where Satan and the demons know that pretty much everyone's bought into selling their soul for fame and money, like what you see going on on the internet, you're going to see more outward signs of satanic worship, and he's going to want people to know his nature, his essence, and he's going to reveal himself more and more openly when society has been fully already occupied by him. Meaning, he's in everybody. He's got his spirits so loaded into people that he can show himself openly and everyone will say amen. And that's what we're seeing in this generation. So you, back, back in the past, you saw more, he's pretending he's not there, slowly revealing himself. And we see it now where he's more openly manifesting himself, especially with the, a massive growth in homosexuality and all this other junk we see uh, in the music industry, right? Regarding the devil? Yeah, so the church would say that, that evil is personified. So evil is not just humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. It's not just something of our making, but the, that evil is personified in what we call the devil. Actually, he's right. Evil is personified. But when he said it's not just of our making, when God created everything, he said it was good. So really, man was made good. So it has nothing to do with our making that makes us evil. It has to do with the fact that there, the man fell, and now we're formed in iniquity because Satan and the demons entered the, the bloodline of mankind. They are the evil. So evil is personified, but what he just articulated is it's half our wicked flesh, like God made us, and it's half the devil, and they kind of work together to make evil manifest in the world. Well, technically, it's 99.9%. Our wicked flesh, right? Yeah, if you take the, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that he says 99% of the time there's no demons there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And his demons. So who is the devil? Who are his demons? The book of Revelation speaks about uh, the fall of the angels where Lucifer rebelled against God and then one third of the angels fell and were cast down to the earth. So evil is personified. And then what would be the goal of the devil and these demons is to get humanity to make the same choice that they made, which would be the complete rejection of God. Can I, uh, can I uh, push back a little bit and just challenge and let's just have some fun with this. Yeah. Uh, and this is purely the skeptic side where, you know, one would be skeptic and saying, you know, what they say to this. When I was an atheist and I was going through meeting with everybody, I'd meet with Scientologists, I'd meet with priests, I'd meet with pastors, I'd meet, I wanted to meet the person that says, hey, this guy knows everything about the Bible, you gotta meet. I wanted to meet those types of people and I would go through my arguments. And now, you know, many of my arguments were amateurish arguments, and, you know, we've heard these arguments. There's a manual with a bunch of different arguments. So it's not like there's an argument that no one's ever seen before. So a case for Christ, case for church, case for this, case for that. You know, mere Christianity, go through all the books that is out there, right? Okay, fine. But, you know, this is not even a spiritual argument. This is just a question. So is it fair to say that people were more naive 2,000 years ago than today? Naive in, in what? Naive in a way that it was easier to control the populace 2,000 years ago versus today. Do you think it's easier to control the populace today or 2,000 years ago? Probably today. Really? You think that? Yeah. You think today versus 2,000 years ago? Why do you think? Because I think we're more connected and everybody seems to have a platform on which they can put out their belief or, you know, their thoughts. 2,000 years ago, we didn't have all the technology where everybody could have their own little podcast or show where they could put their thoughts. Man, this guy ain't the sharpest tool in the shed, is he? Nope. 
Even the answer he's given them doesn't make sense with what he just said. What do you think? Do you oh, think it's easier it to control pretty people limited. today or 2,000 years ago? 2,000 years ago. Because people couldn't put out their own content then. Way that a message could be. But in this way, they're easier to control in that you could put out a bunch of propaganda and get people to do dumb stuff. In yeah. that sense. But, you know, in the sense that you can hide the truth from people. Mm -hmm. No, it's harder to hide the truth today. Mm -hmm. Put out. Sure, but so like they could release stuff and have people rioting faster today here you know here's what i think i think that nuance you just articulated perfectly explains it it's harder to hide the truth today but in a sense i do think it's easier to control people going back to that point you made earlier about people being like fame hungry i think today right. people care more about the approval like be, having the right opinions than ever before Right. Well, today people have the option to be famous mm -hmm. from nowhere through social media. Right. So people are much more hyper aware of what they should be doing to possibly attain that because mm -hmm. it's actually attainable. Like right. when I grew up, when, when I was in high school, mm -hmm. I think Facebook wasn't even there. Maybe no one knew about it. And the majority of the time I was in high school... None of my friends were on Facebook. By the time I got into college, people were, were starting to mess with it. But mm -hmm. still, it was people didn't know the potential of it, the fame potential of it, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, back then, nobody was walking around the school wondering if they were going to, like, blow up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You had to be, you know, 0.001% to blow up. You had to have a skill. Sports, music, some kind of talent. You had to work it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then you had to hit it big. Mm -hmm. But today, all you got to do is pull up to some guy on the road, you know, throw a pie in his face and you're famous, you mm -hmm. know? So it's it's a little different. Make it easier to get more of the populace to believe one message 2,000 years ago than today. Possibly, right? Possibly. Possibly. Okay. So where today, you know, you see the, the church attendance down. You see, you know... Uh, 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 tithing is down. You see all this data that's coming out, right? You go to churches, and you're like, okay, they, they're having a hard time with their argument and messaging. Some churches are growing. LDS church is growing. There's some, you know, uh, 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 sanks, you know, that, that are growing. But for the most part, you'll hear a lot of people say church attendance is down. You'll see that data all over the place. It's not, I'm not the one that's talking about this. But going back to it, like I look at my kids. When Melva, who is Mexican, our nanny, she's a Catholic. And I remember watching her the way she would make the kids eat food at night. And I would watch her and she would say, Tico, you better eat this food because coyotes are coming. Coyotes are coming. And she would look outside the window. Coyotes are outside. Huh? And my son would eat the food. Oh my gosh, coyotes are coming. So I'm sitting, I'm like, what the hell is coyote? Okay. At this point, the only thing I can link coyote to is it sounds like coyote. So is it, is she, <laughs> but there's no way in the world she's saying the coyotes are going to come and eat my, so I said, Jen, what is, what is coyote? Is coyote what I think it is? She says, yeah, it's coyotes. Okay. I said, so this woman has been telling these kids coyotes are coming a few thousand times. One day these kids are going to be 38 years old and they're going to be afraid to go back outside in the backyard because they're afraid there's coyotes there. Because when they were kids, somebody told them coyotes are coming, right? So now this, somebody must say, come on, Patrick, what a ludicrous argument you're making here. But I think there's a, a way to control the populace through fear. And, and the way to do that is to convince them that there is such thing as the devil, that he can control you and he can harm you and he can do all these things to you. And then you see people getting scared and it's so much easier through imagination to control them back then Maybe not as much today. Maybe it's still effective. I don't know. Now, again, this is the argument I would make years ago. And there was always a different uh, rebuttal to it. I'm curious to know what you say to this when you hear, maybe we have to convince the populace there is the devil and then let their imagination convince them that they are possessed. And sometimes our imagination can take us to some wild places and do some wild things and some crazy things and uh, things that don't exist. What do you say to that? I would say that, you know, the church's stance on the devil isn't meant to scare people. I mean, the church proposes, but it doesn't impose. I think to me, it's not about having people live in fear. The focus should be on people living in love, which is basic premise, you know, of the New Testament. God is love. And how do people experience that notion of God? See, I would say that you talk about declining, you know, church attendance, the number of people who believe in God is in decline. For me, it's because people don't have a proper understanding of who God is. You know, if you were to ask people, who is God? What is God? What response would you get? Creator. And, they would go to, go ahead. But I think for the most part, people would come up with an, a concept of God that's based on fear, the hellfire and brimstone. So I do think a lot of people today, and this is only my opinion, where people have a distorted image of God. And to me, the ministry of exorcism really is trying
You know, by Patrick's logic, doctors are evil as well, right? Because what does a doctor do? He diagnoses an illness. He helps you to figure out what's wrong so that you can get the appropriate medicine or treatment. The reason we call it deliverance and not exorcism is because that word perfectly describes what's happening. You are being delivered from something. You have something that is making your life worse, making you a worse person. And through prayer and the power of God, you get freedom from that. No one is trying to convince you that Satan is real or that people are, you know, possessed by demons or have de are demonized, right? Have demons in their flesh so that you come up with bizarre, you know, thoughts that make you paranoid. It's, are you already experiencing, can you see it in your own life? The, the wicked thoughts, the wicked desires, the tormenting, all these things, the diseases, things that you can see are clearly a problem and not beneficial at all. And do you want freedom from that? If you do, well, then you need to turn to Jesus. And Jesus has equipped the church. He's equipped believers with the authority to be able to help achieve that. That's all that's going on here, right? Yeah. It's It benefits this idea that, oh, society, the government, the people in power want to convince you that Satan is real to control you. Well, let's say that was even true. What would be the end result? People committing less murders, people stealing less, people, you know, not practicing the occult. We can clearly see that society isn't concerned about making, you know, the people in charge aren't concerned about making this world a better place. No, no, no. Right? So, I'm just saying, his entire logic doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah, there's no payoff for the government or people in power. Yeah. Monetarily, which is what drives them, you know? Yeah. help people have a better understanding of who or what God is. So In really, fact, the... if everyone was scared, mm -hmm. nobody would do anything wrong, and we wouldn't even need the government. Right. Like, exactly. there, we, we wouldn't need an army. We wouldn't need police forces, mm -hmm. judges. We wouldn't need any of it. Right. Focus is not on the devil, and people might be surprised with that response, but it's really about helping people understand who God is and what God wants to do in their life. And God speaks for himself. I mean, you look in the scripture, and he says, your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in your faith. And if you read the New Testament, just an average reading of the New Testament, you don't have to go to seminary, anything like this, you will find that Jesus himself and the 12 and the church as we know it, uh, which was uh, the diaspora that occurred after the stoning of Stevens in um, uh, the dynamite chapters, eight, nine, into Acts 8, 9, and 10, of how the Christian church you know, spread to Galatia, Corinth, Ephesus, and all these places, and later the rest of the world, they were constantly encountering, you know, the spirit, the spirit of darkness. They were constantly encountering Satan. They were very aware of his tricks, very aware of his schemes, and it was very, very prevalent. So when you read that, just objectively, and you, again, you don't have to go to seminary, you see the loving God that gave his life for us, Jesus Christ, and then sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper. And then you also see the spirits of darkness, and it's, and it's very, very clear. So I don't think there's a, a manipulation that's really necessary if a reasonably-minded person just reads Scripture and God speaks for himself. Is there a question? Was was that a comment? No, it it was it was a comment supporting kind of you know. Here you see a little competition between the evangelical guy and the Catholic priest who doesn't know anything about anything. Mm -hmm. So even this guy is is outperforming the Roman. Even this guy who's slightly butchered every scripture that he's quoted so far. And he didn't like misquote it in the sense that it's out of context. But even this guy who has probably, a, I would say, an average level of Bible knowledge for the average Christian in the average church, is outclassing this Catholic priest. Who is one of 70 exorcists in the world. Yeah. Apparently. Or I find 100 that, or whatever, however many now. Yeah. Also, you see a higher level of, you know, logical thinking in the evangelical Christian also. The population yeah. 2,000 years ago is or now, and I say, well, God speaks... Kids. No, I, I get that. God speaks for himself in scripture pretty clear. And I and I I'm a I'm a Christian, so I get that. My my thing is sometimes there are people like a Bob Larson or others that will use mm -hmm. that fear as a way to control a congregation. And we've 100%. seen that happen many, 100%. many times. And I, and I think the question for me is who are they promoting? Are they promoting God or are they promoting themselves? Who do you think they're promoting? 
I think oftentimes they're promoting themselves. The great line in the New Testament for anybody. Pat's like trying to get this priest to jab Bob Larson at every turn, <laughs> you know? That's a Christian and takes their faith seriously. Yeah, that's really wants to be a minister. why it's so important not to charge any money for stuff like this. Because once you take away that element, there is no logical accusation to be made. Right. Against the ministry. And it's also why you shouldn't be selling products like Bob Larson selling crosses. He's selling courses. The Bible says freely give of you as you have freely received. Yeah. Focus a, is, yeah. in reference, it says, I must decrease and he must increase. So the focus is always on God and what God wants to do. And I think when the focus comes on the individual too much is when the person has crossed that fine line. In that, in that regard, this Bob... guy's like conflating Christ with the Father and quoting John the Baptist. And Larson, I, I've, I've seen some videos of him no that he's not a household name to me, but these guys like Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or um, what's his name, uh, Ted Haggard. It, something like if, when I see these people, something in me in my stomach just is like, Ugh, this is this is not this is not legit. I don't know what it is. Call me a skeptic. I see these people coming on stage. Oh, no. Well, you you don't believe, so everything's going to be bogus to you. La, 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 la. And it's just like, yeah. You're actually here to be the skeptic on the show and mock everything. Just BS. I'm not going to curse in front yeah. of, a, of a priest, <laughs> but I could go deeper than BS. So these types of people, these televangelists, does, do you think that this gives the church a bad name? I think I think it does. I mean, I've had people reach out to me before, and they're, they say, I'm possessed. How much will you charge? You know, the church doesn't charge anyone for the ministry of exorcism. It's believed to be a ministry of charity. It's at the core of what the church is really all about, why the church exists. I had a gentleman one time who reached out to me from the state of Virginia, and he was convinced that he was possessed. And I, I talked with him, and I was able to connect him with a uh, mental health expert in his area. But he was still convinced, even though he was told, this is not demonic, you are suffering from a mental health issue. So he called me back and said, I found a professional exorcist. Mm -hmm. who told him that he was possessed by five demons and he was going to charge him $1,500 each to cast them out. Wow. Now, that's really sad because here's a guy that obviously is broken mm -hmm. on many different levels, and now someone's going to take advantage of him. Correct. So do you understand what I'm saying when I say motive? There's not yes. a money for this. So, okay, 99% of them who call you, they don't need you, right? Yeah, and guess what? He's not even doing any deliverances. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about this guy like he's sitting there all day casting out demons and not making money. Mm -hmm. He's sending 99% of them to the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you if he was making money, he'd be saying all 100 of them had uh, demons in them. All 100. Exactly. There's, and there's so many Catholics in America, it's convenient how they can say, oh, this is free a charity, but they only have like 70 guys doing it probably out of like 50 million Catholics, you know? Right. It's ridiculous. And told, go see a therapist, go do see a doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. For the record, anyone from Valuetainment who's watching this, you all have demons in you. And every greedy thought that you act on and every selfish thing you do was inspired by demons that live inside of you. You don't need to be in the occult. A hundred percent. And that Catholic priest might have the most demons out of everyone there. In fact, I'm almost certain he does. Yeah, yeah. The one person that does is the four signs you look for, but you haven't seen it yet, right? Because the four signs of unbelievable strength, speaking a different language and all this, you haven't experienced it. What is the one person that tells you, Karen, we got to meet with this person because this sounds like something's really going on. What are some of the things you notice with the 1%? Because the 1%, the initial things that I would tell them when they first reach out to me is, do the normal aspects of a faith life. You don't have to do anything extraordinary. But, you know, are you are you going to church? Are you worshiping God, whatever faith tradition you Dude, have? are you going to answer the question, buddy? You notice this guy's not even smart enough to comprehend the questions that are being asked? Mm -hmm. You know, the church isn't trying to proselytize anyone through the ministry of exorcism. This guy's like if a somebody new is rooted in some faith tradition, the first thing I would tell them, have you gone and spoken to your pastor? Have you spoken to your rabbi? Have you spoken to your imam? Dude, he asked you, what kind of traits does the demon-possessed person need to have for you to be like, okay, we got one on the hook, boys. This is the 1%. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about, well, we encourage them to go to church. and we do this? You are shot out. Don't belong on a talk show. Don't belong in ministry. I mean, no he's also discernment. Telling them, have you spoken to your rabbi? Have you spoken to your imam? <laughs> what, <laughs> Mister Christian Priest? What? Yeah, 
I didn't even notice that. Yeah, Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I was so mad at the response. Like, mm-hmm. So if you have a faith you know, background, have you gone and explored that with whatever faith leader that you have? Because again, I think a lot of people... Today, <laughs> have you gone to your local Satanist and worked this out, sir? Right. <laughs> this has been your my experience. Your local shaman? They're looking for a quick fix. They simply believe they're dealing with the demonic. Man, this is better than we thought, isn't it? Like we skip, yeah. we skipped through it, and we were like, "There's tons of foolishness here," but it 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 went way past my expectations for f- pure tomfoolery, mm-hmm. for sure. The, the time where the person levitated, and you saw that, okay? How many how many sessions did it take for this person to go back to being normal? Oh, nothing ever happened. You know, what was the results with that individual? Father Carmine would, would meet with people. You know, sometimes people that were dealing with the demonic, it was one session, and they were free. Other times it may have taken multiple sessions. And sometimes people will then ask the question, why is it more than once? Jesus commanded the demons to leave. They did so immediately. And at least in my experience, it has to be. That's not true. The demon on the coast, Jesus said, come out. And it kept talking to him after that. Legion kept talking to him after that. Some places in the Bible, it says demons came out the same hour. Meaning not the exact moment, but within the, you know, Right, right near that, within an hour after he prayed. With the strength of the demonic possession that's taking place. And also there were disciples that couldn't get the demons out. Exactly. So, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Somebody has really been forthright in telling me everything about their situation. Hmm. Sometimes people are embarrassed. You know, it would be like going to your doctor and not telling your doctor everything. Without that information, the doctor can't give you the, the right help that you need. So I always say... I'm not there to judge somebody on why they may have opened up an entry point to the demonic in their life, but I need to understand it so I can know how to help them close that doorway. Also, but again, it's Chris, not just a matter of this. What do you think about this? I think when people hear when Jesus says, he speaks about the fact that some demons can only come out through prayer and fasting. I think a lot of people interpret that to mean, oh, I need to pray and fast for a period of time. And then the demons will instantaneously come out of me. Instead of understanding that the prayer and fasting, the continual prayer and fasting gives you a gradual, continuous deliverance, right? Like right. you're 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 having deliverance throughout the process, after the process. Like, yes, it can act like a crowbar to also loosen it up so that when you right. do a prayer is very effective. Right. But the Bible says fast can loose the bonds of wickedness in the Old Testament. God said, is this a fast that I have chosen, one that looses the bonds of wickedness? So I believe it could be either way. Mm-hmm. You could be in a in a fasted lifestyle in prayer. You can get uh, out of nowhere big one-time shot deliverance, or you could be yawning and expelling demons. Definitely more commonly in a process like you're saying i would say that's more common but i would i also wouldn't discount just going on a fast and the person just gets a immediate de- uh deliverance yeah. either you know i would say that there's certain kinds of demons that can't come out unless you fast as well like if you're dealing with one demon that just doesn't budge it could be a kind like that word kind that jesus said was like a type or, or like a race of, de- not a race, but like a kind of demon, a right? A class. It's a so, class of A class, demon, yeah. yeah. So that's what I would say yeah. you could fast. There out. are demons you could fast for a long time and they still won't come out too. And they they won't but come I, out until you realize what God wants you to see in whatever area he wants you to see it. Mm-hmm. You don't even need to maybe necessarily be living in sin. Maybe God just is waiting for you to see that you haven't forgiven your mother or father or... He had, there's so many reasons why he can uh, tarry in terms of get, like delivering you of a demon mm-hmm. and leave you struggling for a long time. And he's he's he does it to me frequently. He lets me battle demons for a long season, and in in that process, I'm learning things. I'm figuring out things that I was blind to before, and then I eventually get free, and the season's over. And I'll have a greater anointing to preach or greater discernment or just see things clearer, uh, you know, that actually feel lighter when I walk around and be able to experience love more uh, between me and my children, my brethren, whatever that demon was blocking goes away. 
casting the demon out. God has to be invited in. Luke's gospel in, in chapter 11, it talks about how once the demon has been cast out, it goes and wanders through the arid wasteland. And then coming back and finding the house swept clean, it goes and brings seven other demons worse than itself. And they take up residence in the person. Being swept clean, meaning it was cast out, but God wasn't invited in. And I do see a lot of people today who believe they're dealing with the demonic who want the that's not true because God doesn't dwell in the flesh because in the flesh dwells no good thing. So when the demon's house is vacated, it's vacating the flesh, which Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. And when we die and we put off this physical body, we're not taking our flesh with us because God does not dwell in our flesh, nor is he interested in redeeming our flesh. Because God doesn't need to dwell in corrupted flesh. God dwells in the inner man. That's why the Bible says, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit, not one flesh. The Bible also says we're, we're born again in the inner man. I need to go away. And we're renewed in the inner man. That's the part of us he's sanctifying. But they want nothing to do with God. But what they fail to realize is that in an exorcism, Jesus is not a bystander. He's the main actor. Mm -hmm. So if they're not inviting Christ into their life at that moment, if they're a Christian, then obviously things aren't going to play out very well. In an exorcism, where you're doing it by the power of Christ. Christ and the Father are providing the anointing by their spirit to get the demon out. But these people who totally dissociate the minister from the deliverance session are not biblical either, because Jesus said, in my name, they will cast out demons. So we cast out demons in his name. So we're the ones casting out the demons by the authority and through the power of Christ. Also, when the disciples asked Jesus, why couldn't we get this demon out in the book of Matthew? He said, because of your little faith. Right. So he was also, he was associating the faith of the man casting out the demon to the success of the deliverance as well. That's right. And they don't want that to t be the case. They want everyone to dissociate from this situation. I don't need to be directly involved. It's all God. Most of the people who ha say they have the demons don't have them. So when you take all these positions, at the end of the day, what ends up happening? Nothing. Right. No actual freedom. No actual kicking the demons out of their house because... Satan uses this Catholic Church to keep his demons in their dwelling places. There's a reason that the, all these demons follow Satan. Obviously, he's more powerful than them, and he was created that way before he even uh, fell, when he was called Lucifer. Right? He's still called Lucifer, but obviously he was a greater class of angel. But also, them being in his kingdom, he needs to keep them in vessels because they can't express themselves like they want to when they're out of a body. So a big part of all this scam the Catholic Church runs and these doctrines you've heard out of this guy's mouth is just to keep his kingdom in their homes, to keep his underlings abiding in human bodies where they can experience lust through porn or drugs or greed or whatever. Do you think there's more demonic activity today or we just are more aware of it? I would say, and this has been my experience over the last 17 years, it's not that the devil has upped his game, but that more people today seem to be willing to play the devil's game. What's the devil's game? To get people to reject God. An inch from Christ is... Well, right. that's not biblical, because the Bible says that he that will let will let until he's taken out of the way. Times will get more and more wicked as, as in, up until the end. People will wax more and more wicked. So what he just said is unbiblical. The reason that we, we're seeing what we're seeing is because God's taking his hand off the earth and allowing Satan to abound, and that is the root cause of the wickedness in the first place. It's not that people are just like, oh, I'm more willing to accept what's already there. They're more willing to accept it because they've already been corrupted. This guy doesn't even understand what comes first, the chicken or the egg. The corrupting of mankind comes before the corrupted, the corrupt behavior. This guy doesn't get it. He doesn't get it at all. That's his game. Mm -hmm. So just non-believers. Correct. Specifically it's, in Christ. Yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of people, you know, you look at a lot of satanic groups. Mm -hmm. Some of them, are, they're very various levels. I think some that are on the superficial level don't really worship Satan, but their goal would be to remove God mm -hmm. from the conversation. You see that played out where... 
maybe some government groups get together and they have some type of opening prayer and then satanic groups will want the the right to come in and be able to offer some prayer as well. Mm -hmm. And I would say it isn't that they want to offer a prayer. They simply want prayer to be eliminated as a part of that gathering. Is Jesus the only cure for someone who's possessed? Ah, I see. I would say ultimately it would be with God. So again, you look at other faith traditions and yeah. Again, I would go back to what I said earlier. The Catholic Church doesn't have a monopoly Mm -hmm. because ultimately it is what God is Okay, Ben, now you could accuse him. Go ahead. All right, I accuse him. (laughs) He's not even hiding that they believe that Jesus isn't the only deliverer. Is the only deliverer. What more what more evidence? This man was sanctioned and stamped with the seal of approval by the Catholic Church. He w- he went to Rome to to learn for what? 3 months? Bro, what more proof do you need that the Catholic Church is a false church? I don't know what more you need than that. This is not just some guy wearing a Catholic costume you know, claiming Catholicism. He got the seal of approval by all the men in charge. This is what we believe. Yeah, and all the guys that attack you for not being Catholic, Mm -hmm. they will now say, well, this doesn't represent the view of what... And and nothing does. When there's topless (laughs) men dancing in the Vatican, no, that that was just a bad pope who liked to watch half-naked men spin around stripper poles in the Vatican. Mm-hmm. Oh, if this exorcist is saying dumb things, oh, that's just one guy. Right. We we are the original church. Well, if you're the original church and you were founded on a rock, then what kind of discernment does your church have to let this clown loose in society and mm-hmm. represent the church? What kind of what does that show about your foundation? Because where where I'm from, you build on a good foundation, the building stands nice, mm-hmm. you know? So this this kind of clownery shows that you're not built on the rock that was Christ, or if you want to call it Peter or whatever. Mm-hmm. It just shows Yo, I... you're not built on either Christ or Peter, because this is a joke. Absolutely. Right, and when there was the time when there was only 12 people doing this, like you said, there was a time when he was one twelfth of the Catholic Church's delivering power. Mm-hmm. And this right. is what he believes. You know, that's right. crazy. Right. Like a million videos. And of- clearly he must have improved and gotten smarter with time. So we could only imagine what a tool shed <laughs> this guy was when he started, mm-hmm. when he was uh, representing one twelfth of their army against the devil. Who approved Someone this? Who's- this, is, this is one of the worst things I've ever seen. From the Catholic Church. They don't care. Look, if he's in in the pedo ring or he's keeping his mouth shut and he's a good little boy, they don't care what he says. They got <laughs> all the money, the real estate. It's all done already through their wicked connections and, and th- the things they've established in the past. I personally right. think the Roman Catholic Church is just an extension of Egypt. Go ask yourself, why is there an obelisk in the middle of their uh, St. Peter's Square over there? That's mm-hmm. what it's called, right? St. Peter's Square or Center or whatever? I believe so. I think it's St. Peter's Basilica, from what I remember. Mm. Yeah. So th- th- these guys are bringing ancient Egyptian mysticism right into their central headquarters, and they got peacocks in there and all weird kind of uh, stuff, statues, different things, right? That's by the devil demon. Think about it, guys. When all these cultures that were demonic were dissolved, where'd they go? Where did Rome go? The demonic uh, situation of the Roman Empire. It just, the leaders just shuffled their themselves into a Vatican. The, the, the power structure of this world shuffled itself into the Vatican. That's all. Mm-hmm. Have you, and it's always a cross that they put on their forehead. I never see, you know, Star of David or a Crescent Moon or, you know, a Buddhist figure, a Hindu figure. Uh, so it seems to be, I know you said they don't have a monopoly, but you know, it's probably more prevalent, Yeah. at least from a Christian perspective, you know, why is a crucifix used? You know, so Jesus at the beginning of his public ministry, you know, he's baptized and then he's driven out into the desert by the spirit where he's tempted by the devil. The devil's not successful. Then we're told the devil leaves him for a time. When does the devil return? It's in the garden of Gethsemane when the devil enters into Judas, who then betrays Christ, which leads to the crucifixion. As Jesus is being crucified, the devil believes that he has won. Dude, you think that that's the first time the devil returned after he was tempted by the devil in the desert? That the first time he returned was the betrayal of Judas. Mm -hmm. Let's not also forget when Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. 
Right. You know, so. The moment of his perceived victory actually becomes the moment of his defeat, which is why a crucifix is used. So it's not, you know, the crucifix that has the power. It's what it's pointing towards our redemption in Christ. It's the same way with like holy water. Mm -hmm. I, people tell me all the time, well, you know, I went and got the exorcism kit. You know, it, I got the water, I got the oil. The water points to our baptism into Christ by which we have become a new creation. If somebody's just using water for the mm -hmm. sake of water, that's not going to do them any good. It always has to point to something greater. Got it. When I was young, I used to believe in uh, vampires. So the real question is, what is the greater thing that when a Muslim person or a Hindu person or a Jewish person tries to perform an exorcism, as he would call it, he is saying that in Christianity, it's the crucifix and the holy water pointing to Jesus. Well, what is it in these other faiths that they have and what is it pointing to? Whatever it is, it's satanic, but he's already said it's valid. It's valid. He's already said, right. admitted that Christianity does not have a monopoly on the casting out of demons. So he is now also indirectly admitting that there is true, real spiritual power in these other faiths. Right. I don't think he'd have an answer for you. And then, you know, the, you know all those movies, that kind of that kind of stuff. Uh, and how do you defeat a vampire? Holy water, sunlight, uh, garlic, or you behead the, the vampire. Or, wooden, or a crucifix. Or a wooden stake. Okay, that too. Wooden, so, and then I realized, yeah, wait, wait, probably, it's got to be oak. It was an probably oak Probably not. Vampires probably don't exist. I don't want to, you know, let the cat out the bag. But they're probably not really here. It's sort of, you know, folklore, what have you. But it seems that's, there's a, is there a metaphor there with yeah, a lot of people, like, also the Salem witch trials, right? People thought that these women were possessed by black magic and they were burned at the stake. So there's, it's... There's sort of hysteria. Hysteria can take over. There's right. no doubt. Well, Pat asked you a question 2,000 years ago. Was it easier to convince people versus today? I wholeheartedly believe that it was much easier back in the day, right? Today, you can have a million different opinions. You've kind of figure out, maybe you can kind of live in an echo chamber or a siphon, depending on who you're listening to. But back in the day, there was one book called the Bible that everyone kind of had to listen to, depending on where you were in the world or the Quran or the Old Testament, what have you, and people kind of fell into place. So... I don't know. I just, again, skeptical. And, I, and I'm looking for, for answers here. And, and then it, it just seems this is very common in the Catholic faith. I'm Jewish. I've never seen anyone who's Jewish possessed by the devil. So you talk about this all the time, that <laughs> words have power, words have power. If you keep telling yourself you're a loser, you're nothing, you'll never amount to nothing, guess what happens? You're probably never going to amount to nothing. So if you keep seeing things like the devil and possessed, even, the devil... But of course, that's not biblical. Even if you're a Jew or Jewish, Old Testament, God sent an evil spirit to persecute Saul or to oppress Saul or torment Saul. So, you know, you, you just believe that was a one-time thing that never happened before and never happened again? Yeah, he's saying he never saw a Jewish person that's possessed. He never saw anyone that was possessed, so. Yeah. You kind of fall into that trap. That's kind of where I'm at with Yet this. everyone he saw was possessed. Yeah, I, tell me I'm crazy. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm an idiot. I had a friend. His name is uh, Saul. Okay, mm -hmm. and he lived in Silmar. And Saul was a great fighter. Him and his brother were fighters, boxers. They were insane. Strong, like just they would knock people out in the heart, and they knew how to fight. Like I'm talking MMA fighting. But I would go to his place, and he would say, "You won't even believe us." I said, "Do you believe in the devil?" He says, "I said, what does the devil look like?" And he told me, "So tell me exactly what it is. I've met him before." Yeah. I said, "You met the devil before?" He mm -hmm. says, "I have." So I said, "So tell me what was it like?" He says, uh, "One day." The devil was pulling me from my leg out of the house. And my brother was pulling me back in the house. And the devil was trying to pull me in. We were going back and forth. I was able to pull him in and the devil got away. So I heard his story and I'm like, you really believe this? He says, yes. I'm like, how do you believe this? He says, well, how do you not believe this? So we're, we're going back having yeah. this friendly debate. But to me, you know, if, if I were to say some denominations are way more creative on how they sell the devil to their congregation and the credibility of it, and it really, really gets some folks to... Go in because okay. So imagine if you're we're about to play. Didn't he say he's a believer earlier in this? He's a Christian. He said that. Yeah. So why is he always insinuating that like the devil could be fake in some sense? Well, it's not that not he. A it's not that he believes the devil could be fake. He just believes the supernatural isn't real. Well, but, then he's not a Christian. Well, I mean, obviously he's not. Tapes here. But is he really Michelle. that different from the majority of modern day Christians? No, I think, I I guess he's like a Donald Trump kind of Christian. Like, mm. I use the Christianity to show that I'm a conservative, 
but I don't actually believe in any of the stuff in this book. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. Okay. If you're in your house by yourself and you're watching this podcast at 11 o'clock, you live in a one-bedroom apartment and you hear some noise from outside or a light <laughs> and you're watching this, what, what do you think your imagination is going to go? If you're a regular human being, you're going to say, mm-hmm. you know, like, ah, okay, it's not a big deal. Let me tell you. If you're a regular human being, but one time, have I told you a story what happened when the next door neighbors at a hotel were making yes, a lot of noise? Yes, of course. And you put the... But I haven't talked about it on the podcast. So I, was, I don't know. You have. Okay. We can tell the story no, I'm not going to say it, but the it's point... It's very, but very the point appropriate. is people's imagination really mm-hmm. goes to a different place. Well, especially when it's dark outside. Especially you can play those videos. So, okay, so when it's light outside, yeah, I'm good. Well, at dark midnight, you're gonna probably get a little scared. You know how you said there's some. Uh, uh, is there? Is it caught on tape? Those five yeah. videos I watched last night of exorcisms that was caught on tape. One of them was at a Catholic church where they were recording it through the doorknob. I don't know if you've seen this one or not. Okay, then there was a couple other ones I saw, mm-hmm. but the last one was a case of a guy that the camera's on his face. His that eye- sounds bogus right there, recording it through a doorknob. That's that's foolishness. Roll back, and this is an older clip, and a guy's skin splits. Okay. Now I'm not I'm not kidding with you. This is caught on tape. And I'll send it to you right now if I find it to go can to we this play case. it. I'll find it. I'll send it to you while while we're looking at mm-hmm. this one here. You know, how much what can you tell us about this case that we're not aware of? What 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 do we know outside of what the public knows that this inspired to be the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose? What can you tell the audience about this case of Annalise Michelle? Well, are people familiar with the case? So it's a uh, Assume they're not. Assume none of us are. So they the premise is so this is a uh, a lady in Germany who was uh, determined to be possessed. She was working with a priest, and then uh, she never did receive complete deliverance from the uh, demonic oppression, and then she eventually died. At 23 years old, yeah. she died. And first, she started... Exp- Here's more making people afraid of seeking deliverance. So we're either going to make it where you really didn't need it, and when you do need it, you might die in the process of getting it. So, wow, you're not too motivated to go get free of your demons with this goofball at the helm. That's for sure. Man, imagine how many things you have to go through to get deliverance. Yeah. First, he'll say, no, you're not delivered. You can't be delivered. Second, you're going to be like, I'm 99% probably not demonized. Mm -hmm. Next, you're going to say, oh, I might die. Then you got to go through the psych evaluation, the health (laughs) scan. And then Then if you you pass all that, you got to make an appointment (laughs) at the church, and then you might die in the process. And I imagine it takes a long time to get to be seen by one of 70 priests that have to cater to all the tens, hundreds of millions of Catholics around the world. Right. Probably takes two months to get your exorcism scheduled there. Mm -hmm. And she would go to six different voices she would make, right? It's Nero, Cain, Judas, Hitler, Fleischmann, I'm missing one, Lucifer. Lucifer, And each voice sounds different. And then eventually, I mean, you look at it right now. I want you to watch this. I'm, I'm going to get your reaction on this. This is right here, Annalise Michelle, who, if you listen to her voice, sounds like a regular voice speaking in German. If you want to play so the audience can hear it. Very normal. Okay, very normal. Fast forward to now. What she, uh, yeah, go right there. So this is... This is Hitler. <laughs> I hope you're not watching this late at night. If you are, here's Kane. Very disturbing. Okay, go to the next one. This is Nero. They all sound the same to me. I don't know what these guys are hearing. Like, <laughs> all just... demons are historical figures. That's a new one, too. Right. I don't think I've ever conducted deliverance on anybody where every demon that manifested was somebody out of the history books. Mm-hmm. That's their name. <laughs> but I have seen demons that call himself Cain. And I think I've seen one that went by Hitler also. But I've never seen one person cycle through all historical characters. Like, usually they'll have unique names, like weird demonic names that you can't even really understand, uh, made up of different syllables that are not like the names that we name ourselves with here uh, in this dimension. You know what I mean? And uh, also I've seen them named after the sins that they're perpetrating, like lust, anger. They go by that, you know? No, no, no. No, no, no. Yeah. No, no, no. 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 No, no, no
Look at that one. This is Fleischman. I find it funny. There's like hundreds of hours of like high def video of deliverance sessions taking place, and we're listening to like some babbling with just <laughs> photos overlaid on it, like so we can't see what's going on. Or let's just get on to the other video. Go to the next one. This is who? This is Jeff. Last one is who? Please, 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 please. By the way, this kind of foolish babbling is common with, with in deliverance, for sure. Okay, you can pause it at this point. I said it's going to be disturbing. But I got to leave. I, this is, no, but, well, but, you, but you know what, though? Here's the part. So, first of all, I feel bad for this girl. She passed away, 23 years old. Okay, you're talking about somebody, the mother, that's the mother standing right next to her. I mean, they made a movie about this. This turned into a story that people watched, and, you know... Uh, uh, this is the you know. fishiest situation ever. I've never seen one person pass away from going through deliverance. And I've seen yep. people look like they were on the brink of death, yet they never died. And they were better when it was over. So they're saying she died during the deliverance? Well, they're, they're, they're saying she died while getting deliverance, and they're, they're definitely not articulating that it had nothing to do with the exorcism process. Mm. It's almost like they want you to think, like her engaging in the process of trying to get free was what ended up killing her. Mm -hmm. Like the devil won and ended up, you know, killing her somehow or something. Do they even say how she died or, or what is this? You I'm even sure. even if you try, like yesterday, Vinny, who's outside, who doesn't like Vinny got a shout out on this. But uh Vinny, I said try making the sound naturally. Mm -hmm. Like if you really try to yourself make the sound naturally, go go try to do it. How does somebody do it naturally, right? Okay. You may say, I know certain people that could do it. But this is a little strange, Adam. Uh, you can make a crazy voice. Like, there's people who they can do it. Ah! Like, it's not that, that hard to do, the bro. Part, the part he says, the part he says, and the where priest, it's those four signs, that's, yeah. unbelievable, Hilarious. out of yeah. nowhere power it's like mm -hmm. that comes in. This dude's mocking deliverance, mm -hmm. the deliverance of Christ, and the priest is like, <laughs> So funny. Okay, like, you know, somebody on PCP, I don't know if you've seen somebody on PCP. Yeah, they can lift they, the car up. They can lift the car So that's that part. The other part is, language spoken that you don't speak yeah and the third one is same information and things that you shouldn't know those mm -hmm. those the, the, those two maybe not the first one but those two it's a little so when you see that have you ever personally witnessed somebody like that oh yeah i've seen all those things <laughs> all the time you're being serious you've seen that <laughs> day in the life well and because of the, the number of people that contact me that it would be yeah an ordinary part i mean i have no other exorcist who say they've never dealt with a case of possession in the years that they've been an exorcist. But some of them, are, some of us what? are publicly known and some... That they've never dealt with a case? ...choose to remain anonymous. And those who are publicly known, we do receive a higher volume of people who reach out to us. What's the key to success? Are the ones that are successful and someone has deliverance and can go live a, a life where they've, you know, replaced it with, you know, this belief in Christ and now they're able to live free. What's the key to the success when you've gone through your you know, your filters that you've described, what's that key? Is there a key? Is there something common to the people that... Crazy how this free? guy didn't push back on First any of, all, of I would the, say that... you know, Muslim, you can go to your imam. How could he push back? He can't go after his guest. Isn't he... Challenge. I mean, he was challenging him on other things, no? Yeah, but if he challenges him too hard, mm. he's going to be out of there. Oh, it's yeah. like, you know, when they invite yeah. a guest on... You know, you can push a little bit, but if you, if you push too much, you're gone, you know? Hmm. You know, often oftentimes people that suffer are suffering alone. They're in isolation. How would you like if you had a guest on your live stream and I, like, shredded them? I would be like, thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so bringing them back into a sense of community, helping people. Maybe one read. day we'll do that, guys. Mm -hmm. Maybe he'll have a guest one day and I'll go walking over there and be like, hey, let me talk to this guy, Don. Oh yeah, and just ruin the guy's life. I mean, and just if, watch Don's face. Like, if I was ever, hey, I thought this guy was my friend. Nah, if I ever brought somebody on who was, you know, spewing nonsense about Jesus and about the faith, 
and you came and just shredded him, I would thank you. Hopefully, you would have been shredding him before I got there. Well, that's that's connect with goal. family and friends. Another probably the, the biggest one is helping people connect with God in their life. My understanding was she was a devout Catholic before she became possessed, if you will. Uh, went to church every Sunday, prayed all the time. I believe her knees broke or suffered serious injury because she was praying so often. She had epilepsy. She had a seizure when she was 16 and went into psychosis. So my question to you would be, now, there's a very key point in there where I think, I believe I've heard you say that people will start to speak Latin, like classic Latin that nobody today speaks. Mm. She doesn't, at least not on camera. Perhaps it was, she did it, just wasn't recorded. How much of this could actually just be attributed to her psychosis or schizophrenia or epilepsy or what have you? Like, my problem is, is I, I do believe, but I'm a skeptic, but like people equate this to aliens. And you can almost make the case that aliens have more traction than <laughs> demonic possession, especially today. So, like, what... Obviously, it's just a belief, but, like, why is this real? Why is this just not epilepsy or schizophrenia? Well, there are a couple of comments I was going to make, you know. The church has clear teaching on the reality that evil is personified. But a lot of the things that we witness, there isn't any clear teaching on that. So, like, is she possessed by Nero? Is she possessed by Judas? That would raise the question, can the souls of the damned possess people? And so was that really Judas? Was that really Nero or where Hitler or whatever? Or were they demons who were mimicking those personalities as a way to feed into the audience, if you will? Because again, the, the, the goal of any demon would be to sow confusion, confusion, to really just make things really hard to understand and comprehend. And watching this, that's exactly what would happen. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the, what's the motivation here? I'm 0% questioning your motivation. However... I am questioning the motivation of the Catholic Church. <laughs> Not sure if you've heard the news. Catholic Church hasn't exactly have a great reputation these days. The movie uh, Spotlight, all that stuff. Sure. I'm not talking about the kids. and all. We won't go there. But, I mean, if we do, whatever. But not exactly the best reputation these days. But I'm talk you're talking about motivation and incentives. Maybe, uh, you know, if the church kind of promotes demons, if there's no demons, maybe there's no devil. And if there's no devil, maybe there's no God. So maybe going down that path, it behooves the church to sort of incentivize that there are in fact demons and to go down the path of well the demons the god you know the devil and all that so i guess my question is from a you asked about motivation what, what incentivizes i'm not saying that it's you mm -hmm. but there is seems to be an incentive for the church to promote these demons or these exorcisms because you know how would how else would you go towards the path of god you know good and bad type of thing if there's no devil i would say you know it isn't that the church is promoting exorcism the church is promoting God. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't go out and randomly say to people on the street, hey, I think you're possessed, you need an exorcism. So it isn't that I'm going out mm -hmm. and telling people they need an exorcism. It's people that are coming to the church and then out of a ministry of charity, the church will look into what they believe to be the case mm -hmm. and then to weigh in on that. Now, ultimately, because the majority of people, as I mentioned, are, have already self-diagnosed, if I tell somebody that I don't believe that they're possessed, guess what? They're going to find somebody out there who's going to agree with them people will continue to shop around until they get what they want. Yeah, so but you, that, want you said that you just wanted to become a priest, right? That was your motivation. Right? That's really, Pat, but, Pat that's core, you but that's at the core of, of Christianity is, you know, what did Jesus do in his life? You read biblical accounts, and I would suggest that Jesus came to destroy the mm -hmm. devil. But my, and that's I, the work of the church today. My question is, Pat said, why would you want to become an, exor an exorcist? He's like, well, I didn't really want to become an exorcist. I want to become a priest. And then you got a phone call one day, I assume, by the church. And they're like, you're up, buddy. We're going to need an exorcist in Indiana. And you're the guy. And I assume you're not going to say no to that. No, so, because as a priest, when you ordain, you promise obedience to your bishop. And exactly. Successor. That's so, my point. So they're going to say, hey, time for you to become the exorcist. You say, all right, I promise obedience. So that's my new job. So it's part of you're it. not going to say no. So like, that's your job now. So now it's your job as an exorcist to go do exorcism. So back to my initial point, it's sort of like the church is but even when pushing I this upon but even the having, clergyman. But having that role, mm -hmm. it's really up to me to determine how to live that out. It's not that the bishop's calling me every day and saying, hey, I, I expected you to do 10 exorcisms today. <laughs> it really is, even when I got the appointment, it's really up to me to determine how to live out that. So, <laughs> so he's one of 12, but he could just be sleeping on the job eating Twinkies. He Once could, a month. Yeah, he'll run it at his pace. They they get a lot of leeway there. I mean, I could choose to remain anonymous. The bishop who appointed me, he even encouraged me to help educate people mm -hmm. what the church believes and teaches to, to use it as a... Uh, oh, an, please. They chose you to be the talking head for this, which is <laughs> why you're on all different YouTube channels. Educative role, if you will. 
But again, there are some exorcists. You can just kind of stay off in the shadows and mm -hmm. nobody will even know who you are or what you do. And but they, the church is aware you're out there doing podcasts. No, that's not biblical. Jesus became famous when he began to cast demons out. So I'm putting, putting this out there. Sure. Okay. But again, and, but it's a way to help educate people. And, you know, people can agree with me. They can disagree with me. They can agree with the church or disagree. But my goal <laughs> is simply to present, take advantage of opportunities, present what the church believes, what people do with that. It's up to them. I'm not offended or I don't get upset or angry. It's just a matter of saying, this is what the church believes. I throw it out there. What people do with it, it ultimately is up to them. But what, what do you say to someone who's listening and saying, why are a lot of these things happening specifically in the Catholic church and not necessarily some other churches? Well, I would go back to what I said earlier, that uh, half the people that I talk to are not Catholic. So it isn't that it's just happening in the Catholic church. I think it's happening in a broad base of society but the Catholic Church seems to be where the majority of people go when they believe. All he just did was tee him up to say the Catholic Church is the true church. Deliverance can only come through Jesus. The fact that he's even fumbling this, which of course we know it's false. The Catholic Church is a satanic den of idolatry. But it just shows the Catholic Church is the one world religion, like guy at the, the steering wheel of that nonsense. He's just, every chance he gets, he uses it to try and bring in everyone. Oh, half the people that call me aren't even Catholic, you know? Right. And so, yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost just like insane. there's, a, there's many valid ways, but we're like the Yankees of casting out demons. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're up against the demonic, but I wouldn't say that everybody who's dealing with the demonic is Catholic. Because even as a priest, I've been a priest now for 31 years. I mean, I don't preach on the devil all the time. My focus would be preaching on God and trying to focus on the importance of goodness and love. Those are the things. Tom, you've been part of church for a long time as well, right? Mm -hmm. How many times did you see people coming in to a non-denominational church about needing a parent needing an exorcism or they're going through, you know, uh, they're possessed or they're going through it? How many of those stories have you heard? I've heard quite a few, but at the front of the pulpit, unfortunately... Uh, to answer your question directly, in most American Christian churches, I think they've done a very poor job of, of not focusing on it, but even touching on it, because many of them don't want to be seen as um, sensationalist or weird. Whereas the Catholic Church has done, I think, a very good job of basically saying, hey, we're training our priests in this. We have people that are called. We're calling people out mm -hmm. through, their, through, their, um, through their traditions or standards, the bishop calling you out. Uh, I don't mean calling you out like in the, the modern day we say it, but calling you into a particular ministry of service. Um, in, the, in the Christian church, what happens is people usually come to the church privately, and it's not really spoken from the, from the pulpit. And those are the two points that I would make, is unfortunately a Christian church does not speak from the pulpit about personal oppression and deliverance very much at all, um, whereas a Catholic church does. But there, are, I know of... And we could talk to a pastor that we both know. People do come to the church office, my son, myself, and they come privately because the American Christians also don't want to be weird or stigmatized. But there's a good amount of it that comes to it privately. I will say, too, that prior to 1972, every priest, when he was ordained, one of the minor orders he received was the Order of Exorcist. So I, I, I went to the seminary in Chicago up in Mundelein, Illinois, and I still remember on the stairs of the sanctuary leading up to the altar – they would have the orders of priesthood, leading up to priesthood, and one of them was exorcist. But after 1972, the church removed that minor order because they really wanted to give the ministry of exorcism to people who were well-trained, not just any priest who would then believe that anybody's coming to him. So I would say that the church has actually kind of tried to clamp down by only having certain priests uh, specialize in the area of exorcism, whereas prior to 1972, it was a common place for every priest to receive the minor order of exorcist. You're saying that then it became sensationalized, and so the church wanted to make so sure. So they're actually going backwards. That's what I'm yep. hearing. There is a because now it's only an isolated few, and obviously they're trained to turn away 99 percent of the people each time. Yep. So basically, they're shutting the party down. Completely. Effectiveness and purity to it. Correct. I saw an argument. I saw an argument made about this to say the, the following. So. Uh, when were when did MRIs become a thing? Uh, uh, can you can you when was the first MRI ever conducted, Tyler? Can you pull that up? When was the first MRI conducted? Okay, uh, 1977. It's the first time we did an MRI. Okay, so that's not a long time ago. It's July 3rd, 1977. So 
up until 1977, we don't fully know what the brain is doing, right? Up until 1977. So a lot of it, if somebody is exercise, doing, you know, uh, exorcisms, it's just maybe a guessing game because we don't know. 1977, we come out with the magnetic, you know, resonance imaging. So I just did an MRI last week. I just went through an MRI two weeks ago for my hand. Broken, two ligaments, fractured. My six-year-old daughter broke my thumb. Something she's going to brag about for the rest of her life. I've broken a couple <laughs> bones in my life. One of them was broken by a six-year-old. She's so proud of it. She laughs every time I say it. So you go get an MRI done in the brain, and then you see the two sides of it, right? You got the structural MRI. You got the defi definitional MRI, okay? One of them is more the structure. The other one's the activity. When they did the MRI, when they looked at some folks that had, you know, they, they thought they were being possessed, uh, on one end, you have the two sides of the brain, okay? The hippocampus and the amygdala, 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 right? One of the sides, it was a reduction of 19.2%, and the other one was a 31.6% reduction in the region of the brain that gets extremely creative and emotional, right? And then the, the argument that this doctor was making, the fact that now that we have the MRI, we are realizing that the brain can really do a number on you when it goes on its own, specifically mm -hmm. the side that's the amygdala side, that's more the creative, the activity, you can kind of see what's going on with it. So the, the, this is what I mean by education, technology, advancement. A lot of this is taking the credibility out to say, all these years we thought there was really people being possessed, but we're at a point right now that when somebody's going through that, rather than going and seeing an exorcist, maybe they got to go get an MRI done of their brain to see what the activity they're noticing. Then the doctor can say, yeah, this person... So the way he's talking right now, he shouldn't call himself a Christian. Right. You know, because he mm -hmm. really doesn't believe in the in what the Bible says. Yeah. Also. And I like like I like his show for a worldly kind of show. I think he's he does a great job, but he I don't think any real true believer born again who's walking in the power of God would be trying to sell this narrative in any sense, even in the in the sense of like arguing about it on a podcast they wouldn't even be putting it on the table yeah also why couldn't it be that whatever is being detected by the mri is being caused by the demonic possession right why, why what what is this logic that when a demon is manifesting it doesn't have physiological effects the bible talks about the demon demons making people sick making people tear at themselves. You don't, over. you don't think if someone were to take an x-ray or an MRI while that was happening, that we would see activity that is not normal? Of course. So then to say then it can't be supernatural is just, he's blinded me, by Satan. Me, have, me and Don have seen a demonized man go in the blood pressure machine at Walmart. Uh, someone in the middle of manifesting a demon. And what did we see? Their heart rate was elevated. Their blood pressure was high. Yeah. Pulse 120 something, hot, mid 120s. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure 147, uh, a healthy individual in mm -hmm. that area. It doesn't make any sense. Obviously, if it can make you sick. People are going to be like, hey, you guys really set a demoniac in the blood pressure machine at Walmart? Yeah. They wanted to do it. Yeah. <laughs> they were concerned about their health. Yeah. And so. then when they sat down, you know, they manifested and we saw the physiological effects, which should not be surprising because demons made people sick in the Bible. So clearly they can have a physiological effect on you. I don't Same even... with the, the deaf and dumb spirit. Yeah. Someone was literally deaf because of a demon. And I bet you if they did a scan, they would be deaf for a reason that they could detect. You know? Yeah. Maybe we should reach out to Patrick, see if he'll have a real, you know deliverance minister on his platform yep, that, would, yep. that would be awesome to see chris on there right yeah that'd be crazy tell him to bring the catholic too while he's at it <laughs> that would be the best mm -hmm. yeah set up a debate between me and the catholic mm -hmm. a non-denominational backwoods christian mm -hmm. that casts out demons calls it deliverance verse uh, verse the puppet of the catholic church wearing his clown suit calls it exorcism which in the Bible, that term's even associated with like a failed attempt at casting out demons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Going through this, here's what their challenge you're having. What are your thoughts when you hear a doctor making an argument to say the MRI now validates that, you know, there's no such thing as being possessed and needing a, an exorcist? What would you say to that? I go back again from a faith perspective in the New Testament when Jesus sent his disciples out. 
He gave them authority over unclean spirits, but he also gave them power to cure those who were sick. So Jesus himself made a distinction between ailments that were due to demonic causes and ones that were just purely physical in nature. And I think that that continues today. So, yeah, there are some that are certain. That's not true, what he just said. They do to uh, physical maladies, but I still believe that there are some that are due to uh, demonic causes. But again, that would be going and doing that investigation, trying to determine how that came about. So, but what does the MRI machine tell you? So that you know, oh no, this, this, uh, you know, brain problem is caused by a demon, clearly. But this one is, what metric are they looking at to discern the difference? There is none. There are none. Maybe the printer prints out a sheet of paper that just says not demonic on the scan. Yeah. You said before they come to see you, they got to go see the doctor. They got to have this. They got to have that. Is a part of it an MRI? Is a part of it to go see the brain activity that's taking place or no? Whatever the expert would, would recommend. Yeah, like Dude, by the imagine way, they were like literally frying people's brain with the MRI, you know, the contrast and the radiation. And then just mm-hmm. drugging them, putting them in the psych ward. Like you like if you even confess you have a demon, you might be getting fried and medicated by the Catholic Church and institutionalized. Mm-hmm. So yeah. so basically the way these guys are, you're going to be afraid to even tell them you have a demon. You yeah. ain't even going to want to go in and confess that you think you have a demon. Yep. Let's go through the exorcism. That's Did, sad for a church of God where you got to worry about that stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you ever communicate directly with a doctor of the patient or the individual or not? Have you ever had a direct communication with a doctor or no? I, I, I will seek that always but not all these other professionals would be willing to accept that maybe there are spiritual causes, so they may not be willing to speak with me. Or oh, they may not be willing to speak with you. Mm. Right. Got it. Yeah, I, I, would be, I would be curious to hear a debate between a person who does exorcist like yourself and a person who has experienced doing this with samples and examples they have to bring MRIs and say, here's a person that we thought was possessed, but this is the challenge that they were having, and here's how we were able to help this person out through XYZ. Um, Look, I'm 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 in a place where it's it's very very close relatives that I've witnessed going through stuff like this, and and it was as strange as it could be, where you sit there and you watch this and you say, okay, now I've seen the trend of how to get attention for this, and you know you know how sometimes like when somebody is not getting love from somebody, what's their way of getting love from the other person? You know, some some dark places that people will go to to get love from somebody and get attention. You know, I want to kill myself. Okay. Yep. I don't know if you've ever gotten a call from somebody saying. I'm committing suicide. I'm going to kill myself. You ever gone through that? Has that? I've dealt with. Okay, so you, I know you've dealt. I'm not asking specifics, but we've all. Everybody in their families has some strange stories, right? With different people, and you know, it's almost if the if the if the parents or the individuals in that person's life gives it too much attention, they want to do it more mm-hmm. because it hurts you. It's like, oh my gosh, please don't commit suicide. Like they almost, it's it's a look. We're here for you. We love you. There's more, you know. There's more things that we need to do. But I've seen the, the, you know, the other side where sometimes people also use some of these things to get attention because it's a form of love. Maybe they didn't have love growing up. There's a lot of, a lot of strange ways people are raised. Of- there are people that really have demons that really drag it out too long because they just love that somebody's catering to them. That's mm-hmm. true. Yeah. But it doesn't negate that. the fact that the demons are real. It like someone doing something for attention doesn't equal the demons don't exist. So right now, the argument he's making is it's not a good one because one doesn't equate to the other. Right. That would be like accusing every person who reaches out because they have suicidal thoughts of seeking attention. Right. Right. And because some do it to seek attention, no one has su- real suicidal thoughts. Exactly. Messed up families in the world. Well, we're very, very good at hiding our you know, dirt in our families from people. But we got some real messed up lives that people have been raised in. And sometimes, you know, we say, in, even with that, I'm going to go do something big with my life and I'm going to win. And sometimes we use that as a way of, this is why I'm not winning. But I'm not convinced either side is 100% right. I will say, I was, I was as you were talking, I was thinking about a, a man who was referred to me. He had already been diagnosed as being schizophrenic. So he already had a psychiatrist he was working with. He had a caseworker. But then the priest in his parish asked if I would meet with him, and I did. And you know, I made I went through my intake questionnaire and all these things, and determined it was not demonic. This truly was something of a mental health issue. 
I didn't want to just tell Here's him that. Here's the fifth case he's discussed that wasn't even... Has he even discussed one legit exorcism that he's been the head of running it? I didn't hear it's one. It's always like him standing in a room when he first got into the casting out demons game, mm-hmm. you know? Well, Every other one is like, they were not, they were schizophrenic, they were not bad. Send him on his way. His psychiatrist and caseworker were willing to meet with me. So me, the gentleman, and then these other two folks we met. And so I said to him, you know, we'll call him Joe. Joe, you're not possessed. And the psychiatrist Imagine says to him, him Joe, meeting with like a doctor and a psychiatrist to like figure out why someone's totally violated. <laughs> you know, this is, it's like yep. Mo, Larry and Curly all sitting down to wonder why the guy's got demonic symptoms. You know, father says you're not possessed. What is your response? And I was really intrigued by his response because what he said was this. He said, I'm disappointed. He said, look at that. To the Look psychiatrist, at that, you can tell me that the I'm schizophrenic, but you can't tell me. The psychiatrist is disagreeing with the priest now and being like, no, you're wrong. Actually, he needs to see you. You know, mm-hmm. after he sent him away to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist is like, no, this guy's in trouble. You better take him <laughs> back. <laughs> why? He goes, if it's the devil, I have my why. So I think there's a lot of people when they're trying to sort out what they're dealing with, they may turn to the demonic. But again, I go back to my role as an exorcist, I need to have moral certitude, believing beyond a doubt that this truly is something demonic in nature. And as a priest, I would never use the rite of exorcism as a diagnostic tool. Or so if I... what's the worst that ha- could happen if you were totally wrong? You prayed for a guy to get free of the devil for, for a half hour? He acts so like, like He acts like the worst thing in the world is if I start to invest my time into a guy and I have to pray for them. When there's really not a demon there. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people will hear this and they'll be like, wow, he's probably saying that because there's a good chance you'll die. You know? Yeah, right. I mean, like, but what is the fear? That's, <laughs> right. what, that's what I'm asking. Like, what is the disaster that's going to happen if he's mistaken and he, he thinks it's a demon and he goes to try and engage it as, as such? Also, we understand mm-hmm. demons. They're liars. They're deceivers. Clearly... If they're in you, they don't want to get out of you. And so they would try and do things to convince the person who has the demons and, you know, some novice, some spiritual novice that there is no demon. So if you believe that you have the power to cast out demons because you've been given that power by God, that authority by God, and you believe that people do have demons, why wouldn't you have the opposite mind? Like, let me see if it's a demon. And if it's not, we'll deal with that afterwards. Like, why right. wouldn't you take the attitude, I'm going to pray for everybody. And then if nothing happens, then, hey, you know, maybe it's something else. You know. Yeah. Looks like he's lazy or he's deceptive, one or the other. Yeah. Somebody really wasn't possessed. I wouldn't just pray with them just to kind of feed into whatever they believe. Because ultimately, I believe that would cause greater harm. So I have to tell people what I believe. Okay, ultimately, be the... that would cause greater harm. How? You haven't articulated that. Situation, and then what they do that, what they do with it is up to them. All he's and again, saying it goes is back he, to he has no discernment. He into- has no spiritual discernment, no just real world discernment to be able to no emotional intelligence to be able to detect when someone's putting on a show as opposed right. to when they're actually being tortured by a, an evil spirit. Right, right. So that's ridiculous, man world you can find anybody to agree with what you believe Mm -hmm. and if i tell somebody that's schizophrenic they've been diagnosed that they're not possessed they're going to go out and find somebody else who's going to validate that they are possessed and take advantage of them let me let me ask you a strange question Uh, have we ever had anybody that's been famous so he just admitted that telling telling them they're not possessed holds the same kind of dangers in his opinion as acting as if they were Mm -hmm. because he said they'll go out and and someone else will take advantage of them Mm mm-hmm Oh, what's the only have... difference? He doesn't have to do anything. And this guy do. actually thinks there's a possibility that a schizophrenic isn't demonized. Right. But right. how does that make sense? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was ever possessed that needed an exorcism, exorcism done on him. I can't think of anyone that Why? publicly Why? Why? Like, Let me explain what I mean by that. Like a, a basketball player, mm-hmm. baseball player, an actor, a politician, a military leader. In- he asked him if he knows of any famous people that needed an exorcism, and he's like, I can't think of any. No. Yeah. 
Yet you got like uh, Jay Z and all these goofballs literally wearing Aleister Crowley shirts and and putting up satanic symbols all day long. Mm -hmm. yep. Nicki Minaj claiming to have alter egos, different beings popping up. You know, mm -hmm. Lady Gaga, Katy Perry having sex with them at night, or you know whatever stories they were telling. Bob Dylan saying he sold his soul uh, to the commander in, in in another dimension way back when, and he's holding up his end of the bargain. Yet this guy doesn't know of any celebrities. Michael Jackson, who literally mutilated his body, bleached himself out, chopped chopped himself up with plastic surgery, hung out with little kids all day. And no, for you okay. Michael Jackson fans, I'm not saying he did. He he did hang out with little kids all day, like a which weirdo. Which is very weird. Which is weird. Super weird. So, like, I don't know if he actually did it or he was false accused, but look, to me, he's a whack job. Yeah. And he's to be considered guilty just by his weirdness. Yes. So, yeah, that's where I stand on that. Somebody that was somebody of influence. Why haven't they ever? Why, if the devil is doing what he's doing why isn't he going and possessing those guys from preventing them from maybe there's a you know maybe there's somebody that's can make a why is he going after people that we don't know regular folk can i follow up because on he wants to drag everybody down he's got enough demon demon forces to do that yeah it's not like he needs to pick or choose at like oh i'm only gonna ruin this guy's life because i'm low on resources to destroy things i mean come on yeah, also, you got to think, the people at the top of Hollywood, they're all in bed with Satan. So they're going to be some of the last people to call upon a priest or a pastor or anything for deliverance from demons. Right. Okay. I actually want to hear that answer, yeah. and then you can follow Well, that. what you hear from these famous people yeah. is they've sold their soul to the devil. Yeah. That's how they got famous. And so to your point, yeah, I'd like to hear his response. Yeah, because again, I think it would be that somebody would have to come public, first of all. They would have to want to share their story. There could be the stigma that people will think that they're not in their right mind, and then maybe they're going to lose their whatever position of power or prestige that they have, so they may not be willing to step forward. It goes back to the question again, so why does the average Joe get possessed, but somebody that's more prominent doesn't? And the, the key would be whether or not somebody is truly seeking help. That's the key thing, whether or not somebody's famous, whether or not they're not famous, Again, I don't go out and search for people that I believe to be. Yeah, but if that. the spirit gets a hold of you, do you have any control? So if you're even if you're famous and powerful, if the spirit gets a hold of you, you mean to tell me you're more powerful than the spirit? No. Nope. You know what I'm saying? It depends on the degree that one's dealing with the demonic, because something of the person always remains free. That's why even somebody that's possessed could ask for help. It's not total. There is something that's called a perfect possession, where somebody takes their free will and they unite their free will completely with the demonic. So there never would be any... The demon needs the person it's living in to function in society so it could carry out its work. So the demon allows the person to function, to get into situations where the demon can perpetrate its works throughout society. So oh, yeah. no like... demon possession is usually full time, all day, all the time. It can happen, it's very rare, and usually it won't last months or years. It might be a season where someone's, you know, the demon's possessing them. It does, but it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the exception to the larger amount of ways demons manifest in people. Right, and Beyonce, she's a very good example. She's normal, and then when she gets on stage, she claims that she gets possessed. And she right. does certain dances for the demons or whatever. Right. And and most of these people, most of these people who are in that state, is that mine? Yeah. Most of these people who are in that state, they don't, they don't want people knowing about it anyway. And what they're doing is they're giving way when they want the demon to come and manifest. They're lowering their cognitive awareness and kind of relaxing their mind, and they can allow the demon to take over by dropping their efforts of using their own consciousness and relaxing their body. So they know if they dissociate, the demon will come up. Yep. Manifestations, and the fact that there are manifestations would indicate that there's still an internal battle, there's still a struggle right. that's taking place. 
but it could be that somebody is possessed, but because they've resigned their free will to the will of the devil, there is no manifestation. There's no battle to take place. Yeah, but if, if the devil is so strong, why does, he have, why does he have a hard time getting a hold of other people that are influencers? Why, 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 and by the way, to say that, maybe we don't know about it. When you're famous. He doesn't have a hard time. He's got them already. No, He's probably got legions in, in all of them that are doing worldly stuff. Even good people are loaded. You know, the people that get criticism is fame. Like, you know, some people want to go, oh, I'd love to go out there and become successful like that guy or this guy or that guy. And I'd love to have, you know, be a basketball player and get all the fame. I'd love to be a Hollywood star. But the moment you go there, all your business is everyone's business. Hey, this person's brother did this. Patrick Mahomes' brother went through this. Tom Brady's going through this in his, you know, issue. That's why he took a break. That person's going through this. I mean, because even when you're, you can't talk by yourself. Somebody's going to leak something. You know, I told a friend of mine one time, I said, I said, when, I, when you and I talk about my personal life, do you tell your wife? He said, it's my wife. I'm married to her. I said, you can't tell, your, tell my business to your wife. Why? Because even if you tell your wife, what if you and your wife get a divorce one day? What's her loyalty to my secrets of my life that I shared with you and the struggles that I have? There is no loyalty. Mm -hmm. So that has to stay between you and I. He said, that totally makes sense. And it finally made sense. I'm like, okay, great. So even if you're famous, sometimes your biggest fear is, who do I confide in? But eventually you're going to confide in somebody and that person's going to leak you. This is why they'll say, such and such has agreed to a three-year contract extension. Okay, this person has just gone. So I don't know why people who are more, because if let's just say you have to think about the devil, right? If you are the devil, you go take somebody that's got influence over what? One person or nobody? Why would you do that? Then you're a small thinker. So if, if we are saying the devil is as power, which by the way, I do believe, I do believe. He's a small thinker as if he can't do both at the same time. It says the whole world with them, lies in the wicked one. The whole mm. world, you know? Right. Have somebody backing you up. I do believe that. But my interpretation is a different interpretation. My interpretation is an exorcism interpretation. My interpretation is for him to convince you, you know, uh, for, for people sometimes to believe that they don't need help. They don't need faith. They don't need a higher power to back them up. I believe for what I want to do in my life, I need faith. I need, I need backing for somebody to back me up. I want favor. I want favor at the highest level because I do think there's going to be challenges. I do think there's going to be people that are going to get in the way. And I do believe sometimes maybe if there is a devil, he uses people to get in the way of you doing something big. But it's not the devil of, you know, things like this. Because if the devil is really doing this, he should target players and influencers to get them to drop. Because if they drop, then he wins at a higher level. Yeah. And it could be that people are dealing with the demonic. They're just not aware of it. Because ultimately, the devil doesn't want to be in the spotlight. He prefers to work in the shadows, if you will. But you're a bully if you're going after helpless people. Like, what outcome do you have of going after Annalise Michelle? Like, what did you do with that? You see this, this goofball? Now you could be dealing with the devil and not be aware. But 99% of the time, we tell them it's a psychiatric issue. Does that make any sense at all? Nope. nope. I mean, Is this guy the biggest goofball ever? Yeah. Absolutely. So he just admitted the devil could be there, but we may not know. But I send 99% of the people to the psychiatrist. What a champion. Like, let's play the game and go in the devil's conference room with 12 other masters mm -hmm. and, you know, advisors sitting there. Oh, okay, let's go after Annalise Michelle. What's your outcome? What a, what a weak, you know how much weakness you're showing if you're going after a helpless 16-year-old kid? What do you think you did? You didn't do anything special. But then, see, then that, that's a great point. Then the devil is showing he's his true He's the character. devil. <laughs> so the devil believes he's doing something that's advancing his agenda, his kingdom. But ultimately, all that ends up doing is advancing the kingdom of God. Then maybe we shouldn't be afraid of the guy. We should never, no one should be ever be afraid of the devil. Because, because, because the point then becomes... He's not as strong as you think he is. It's through your imagination that if you let your imagination let loose, that's where he destroys you. Because he makes you believe there's a thousand people around the corner that got his back that will fight you. He's by himself. Okay? If that's the argument. Because uh, I think sometimes the imagination gets people to... And the, and the demonic plays on the... Per the Bible tells us to be aware because our adversary's roaming about. It doesn't say don't be afraid of what he can do. You don't fear him. You don't live in fear. But you need to be vigilant and cover your bases because the Bible says the devil has wiles and they're effective. So you have to beware of the wiles of the devil. This is what the Bible teaches, meaning he's crafty. That's what that word means. He's slick. He's crafty. He's sneaky. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So you have to be, you, you have to fear being deceived by him. You just shouldn't fear him more than you fear God. Right. It's memory and imagination. Right. The devil's trying to get into your head. And I think in the role of an exorcism, the goal is to get the devil out of your head and to get God into your head. Because, yeah, the devil is nothing to fear.
you know, a lot of people will watch the videos of Annalise Michelle and, you know, they're going to be terrified by all of that. But again, they shouldn't be. Maybe this is a simple question, but so you, you said earlier you came on the podcast and you speak to people to educate and to show people and help people learn. So I guess the simple question for me is, is why not just film one? I understand that you do it for the privacy of, of the person being exercised, but why not blur out their face? Or why not, like, it, does that destroy the faith element of it? I don't know if it would destroy the faith element. I think skeptics would still be there. You know, if there's a video or some, is someone going to say, well, you can tell it was altered here. You're going to get a thousand people analyzing it from every angle. But I don't even think that if there was one recorded, that people are going to say, well, beyond a doubt, I believe now. Because people are going to say that, again, in today's world, anything can be manipulated. And well, I certainly don't think it would be, you know, everybody would now be a believer, but I think it would do something to help your cause. I certainly think it would it put some weight behind your cause. Because I think there was an exorcism done on, it wasn't a Catholic exorcism, but it was done in St. Louis several years ago. There was a, an archbishop of some church who did one, and it was being televised on television. So it was on television. It was there. An exorcism then happened several years ago. Like one demon <laughs> got cast out several years ago and it was, you know, no, nah, you can find many, many videos documenting this happening. In fact, many of them are on this channel. So, yep. But has that really changed the debate, even though one was supposedly videotaped then? Mm -hmm. Even Father Gabriel Amorth, the former chief exorcist in Rome, there's some question on whether or not he permitted an exorcism that he performed before he passed away in 2016 to be recorded. And there's a recording out there of it. It seems like it was done on a cell phone. The quality is not very good. But there are some people that say that even he had permitted one to be recorded. But there have been exorcisms that have been recorded. Like there's been, there's a famous one that I sent you, Tyler, on ABC uh, News, where they recorded the exorcist. It has millions of views. This is like 10 years ago. Uh, this lady called Becky. You ever seen this, this video? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, this is it right here. I don't know if you want to fast forward. And you see this lady. Yeah, there she is. And she's... Yeah. footage shows what actually really happens in an exorcism. Oh, don't let her go. Ah! Stop it! If you don't get her off me! I would do things. Her name. She was possessed by demons. She firmly believes. Yeah, so she you firmly believes. Now, it turns out she was severely abused as a child, that she had major drug issues, she's had a rough life, she was a prostitute, and she was a member of a cult. How convenient. So you add all that up, and next thing you know, she's possessed by demons. So, so it's, this is, I guess, to... That's the most logical reasoning, though, why someone would be possessed by demons. You have right. intense childhood trauma. You did hard drugs. You joined a cult. If anyone has demons, it would be that person, no? So why are they like, oh, look at all these reasons. This is re So who's supposed to have demons, Ben? Literally nobody. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody is supposed to have, if the people doing all that, it's like, that's a rationalization for why they shouldn't have demons. And then the people who are just living normal lives, they don't have any, it's like, what's, it's, it's. He's just, he's just stupid. That's really what it is. I think, I think that's the truest thing that anyone has said this entire video. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the point that we're kind of making is like. 99% of people that think they're possessed by demons, turns out it's not the case that they have major, major, major issues going on with their body. Something like this doesn't exactly help the cause to believe that there are demons. It just sort of proves the point that, no, there's just some messed up people out there, and when this I don't, is what they're dealing with. Do the presence of all those things negate that perhaps it was a spiritual issue? Or yes, is it, I, I, that's what I'm saying. It negates, it, it negates it for you. Well, I mean... Tough life, abused, drugs. I agree. Prostitute and agree. a member of a cult. I agree. Yeah, that's not exactly the great resume well, that you're going to believe that person. Well, I would look in there that and say, okay, maybe this was sensationalized, right? Maybe, maybe she wasn't. But on the other hand, you say, here's his view. If you were abused, you're just a joke. If you grew yep. up and like you suffered real hardship, like you were born, you know, your parents left you in a basket uh, over the border in Tijuana. You don't deserve to be respected your opinions trash you're an idiot you sh you don't even know if you have demons or not you're crazy <laughs> if you were raped forget about it your opinion doesn't matter eternally we shouldn't even listen to you yep could it be that wouldn't want to be someone like that on judgment day drugs the thinking abuse. they're better than other people because their life was more privileged the other things um and then the cult is what gave the ground or the foothold to demonic activity. I don't know the answer to it. And by the way, it sure sounds fishy. It does. So I'm with you on that, on perception. But it's also, those are avenues that could open up a place where this person could have legitimately... Had, have you seen things like this? 
I've seen things like that. But or again, early life and some traumas and other things that led to ultimately a stronghold. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of a uh, <clears throat> a person that I was interviewing who believed that she was possessed, and she had shared with me that growing up in Mexico at the age of seven, her father began to rape her. So her father raped her from the time she was seven until she was twelve, and then when she turned twelve, her father, she said, turned his attention to her younger sister. Oh boy! Jeez. So she said she was broken, blamed God for allowing this to happen. In her tradition, she turned to curanderos and brujas, you know, witch doctors and witches who said they could mm -hmm. help put the pieces of her life back together. But the, that example of abuse led her down the pathway mm -hmm. into the world of the occult. So she's telling me this story, and she's with a friend of hers. There's me, and there's another priest. And then she's looked at me, and she's crying uncontrollably. And she looks at me and says, will you help me? And I say to her, Jesus is the one who can help you. And when I said that, her eyeballs turned green. Her pupils became slanted like a serpent. And this voice comes out of her mouth and says, who's he? He has no power over us. Her eyeballs turned green. Sounds a little ridiculous. I mean, like, dude, it sounds like this guy's done like four exorcisms in his whole life. And each one of them looked like a uh, M. Night Shyamalan movie, some horror movie, you know? Did this happen in the Bible, by the way? Do we hear anything like this at all happening to demonized people? Like they're literally morphing into yeah. animals and they're flying off the ground. and They're reptilian shape-shifting into David Icke aliens. Seem ridiculous. Everything he's mm -hmm. doing is trying to make this seem ridiculous. You know? So was she possessed by a demon, you believe? So then again, I had her go through steps to see a psychiatrist. Okay. And so he saw... <laughs> He saw her morph into a reptile, and it's still no He's demon. Like, have still you seen no demon. the doctor, though? <laughs> <laughs> and then I did make the decision to pray with her. And when I made the decision to pray... This dude needs to see you become like a Komodo dragon, like right in front of his face, or he ain't praying, bro. Yeah, like, if you don't grow a tail and, like, bite him with some venomous poison on the leg, he ain't gonna believe you have a demon. No way. That's like what I was saying about the Gadarene demoniac. This guy would pull out his checklist and be like, have you seen a psychiatrist? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, man. Her. So we are in a uh, chapel. We're praying. And as soon as I begin praying, there's the, uh, the demon manifests again. There's the green eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And the demon looks at me and says, you can't get rid of us. We've been here for too long and you're just not strong enough. Yeah, but you're talking about a person who was raped by her father, okay? I mean, if you want to talk about a mess, Clearly, up she deserves to be destroyed by Satan after such a situation, sir. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but he's saying well, that that's a, a valid reason for why she wouldn't have demons. It's like, right. this is a perfect opportunity for a true man of God who actually understands these things to explain that that kind of trauma is prime, like opening a door for demons to flood in right demons love tormented the people that are living in depravity they love to to siphon off that negative energy so, oh, yeah. so after, how messed up can you get than that and not only that then he's about to take on the younger sister yeah. after you're 12 so i don't know i'm you know, i'm not a doctor or anything like that but like if you want a prescription for someone who's gonna have a messed up life boom there you go so but how do you just how do you describe the what i witnessed then the the witnesses are different. These are two different. No, I hear you, yeah. but it's not like she was just yes, a normal girl and had absolutely. a nice life and just, you know, every happy-go-lucky girl. And then all of a sudden the devil pops up. Because I we talk never... about some of the most disgusting acts a human can do to another human is what happened to her. And I hear these stories all the time. That's why I don't just run into the room, you know, with my mm -hmm. rite of exorcism book and say, here, I'm to save the day. No. To me, there's no such thing as an emergency exorcism. When those <laughs> things are done is when problems really... Do you think Jesus thought there was no such thing as an emergency exorcism when that demon was throwing the guy into the fire? Mm-hmm. Yep. I think that's a call for, for action, sir. If yeah. a demon's uh, <laughs> throwing a guy pl into, into flames. This is, this is crazy. <clears throat> Arriving at doing an exorcism should be at the end, not at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So like this, what we just witnessed, did somebody just walk in and say, hey, I, I need this exorcism? I have people that tell me all the time, I need to come and have an exorcism today. But to me, I would begin by understanding where the person has been, knowing their history, were they traumatized? Have they been working with the counselor? I even tell people, it isn't just a one angle approach. Perhaps you do need to have some deepened spirituality, but that doesn't mean you need an exorcism. Maybe you need to reconnect with the church. 
maybe you need to find God in your life, but then you also need to be seeing a counselor. Have you talked to your doctor? Mm -hmm. It should be a multifaceted approach. It's not just one approach. Good enough, Pat. What's your uh, skepticism level at this point? Has it decreased? Has it increased? Is it exactly the same? Where are you at right now? I think I think Father Lampert is a good man who is doing good service and and good for his church and society. And and I don't see anything uh, where uh, where I see you know here's a give us this much money we'll do this for you. That's the stuff. That's the mm-hmm. Bob Larson stuff. That those stuff. And he Answer does a lot and he question, walks around Pat. with his cross and he says, oh. No, I feel the spirit. Get out! And he does, like, and it's just, that stuff to me is a... And Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn and, you know, all these other things. No. But, but my uh, problem is the people that believe these people. Like, you go to the Benny Hinn's church, yeah. and there's thousands upon thousands of people. Ah, la, 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 la. I like, hope everyone's watching how uh, charging for this is such a stumbling block for people that, you know, don't have the revelation of that this is the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, just Bob Larson charging. I've been calling him out for years for it. Mm-hmm. Go back and look at my videos. You'll see me calling him out nine years ago, ten years ago. And it's because of this. Yep. <laughs> but there, but there, it, it, is, it is a form of a safety net to believe. And, what and if say- now he was saying, oh, he's selling T-shirts? It would have been the same thing, bro. Mm-hmm. This is why my life is this. Right. This is why it's... it's, it's and I it's, say that because when I met Don, he was just a, a YouTuber looking to, you know, make a living off YouTube. And I, I told him when he became a minister, he can't sell merch. And he didn't. He he never did it. He's, he squashed it. And I, I'm confident now that he's been praying for others and growing in the Lord and maturing, he sees why that... You know, I know he does, but... Yeah, you freely receive, so freely give. Amen. ...comfortable place to lean towards that. But in regards to what you're saying with, uh, you know, the story of the uh, the girl, 12-year-old possessed, daughter, dad, and then the eyes turn green. I mean, if you're saying you witnessed that, you witnessed that, and he says, who, uh, you, you, said, you said Jesus, and who is he? And she says that, who is he? And when was this one, this, when you witnessed this one? This is a recent one? Within the last couple of years. This is within the last couple of years? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I mean, okay. who, who else was in the room outside of you with that one? There was another priest and then a friend of the lady. So there were four of us. The, has the friend of the lady ever spoken about it or no? She has with the, uh, the priest of the church. Anytime I work with somebody, then ultimately I would put them under the care of their, if they're Catholic, their priest. And How many testimonies on YouTube do you see, like, I got deliverance by a Catholic priest and I'm free? That's a good question. Like private videos of people that, like, I mean, this is a massive organization. You would think, like, if you searched it, mm-hmm. you'd find many. I've never seen one. We're going to have to look Me into either. that. Yeah. Somebody's not Catholic. The first thing I would want to do is I that. mean, if us as a small country church, right? Uh, me, an ex-demoniac who became a deliverance minister can come up with hundreds of testimonies that are on the internet of people that claim that they were set free through this ministry, they should have millions. Yep, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So you have a conversation with their religious leader, you know, who's the pastor mm-hmm. of your church, or, and then we just have a conversation. Because again, I'm not That's another weird thing not- about these people. They claim they're doing it, but it, like the attitude is, don't go and testify of this. Yet Jesus told the guy to go into the town and testify of what God did for him. Mm-hmm. The guy with the legion, he said, go tell everybody what God did for you. Yet there's this culture with this guy right here, like this is all done behind closed doors, it's secret, it's private. That's not biblical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Obviously, if somebody's reaching out to me, there's a brokenness there. Now, is it spiritual? Is it mental? Is it physical? I don't know at that point, but I want all of us to try to work together just to figure out yeah. what is going on, just to show some level of compassion or charity towards this person who obviously is hurting. I respect your objectivity with that gentleman who you said, after the appropriate evaluation, she said, sir, you're schizophrenic. And he says, you know, he was disappointed in that because if you had said you're possessed, maybe he has now found a binary yes, no answer. Instead, he's got to work with medical science and psychiatric science on the this amorphous cloud that's schizophrenia that's so hard to work with. So now that's harder to take. And so it's easier to say, gosh, why can't I just be a simple answer? Yep. And that might be the difference between today and 2,000 years ago is that 2,000 years ago, people might have accepted an answer. 
whether it was valid or not, who knows. But today, people will keep searching until they find the answer that they want. And they're going to find it from somebody who's going to tell them what they want to hear. I wonder how many people have been told with a certainty by a pastor or a priest or somebody that they're possessed. And because that person was seen as a person of a lot of influence and power in their lives, that they bought into that. So you know, like, 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 I would love to do a test. Here's a test. I would love to, and, and obviously we can't do this case study because nobody would sign up for this. But if we were to take 10 kids, okay, and they go to two different schools, okay, and one school of thought, we would never do this test. But I wonder what the results for this would be. One school says devil exists and most of you guys are most likely possessed and says that to them over and over and over again in that school that they're going to. Fast forward 10 years later, 20 years later to see what kind of life they live. Then the other 10 kids to go to a different school and the leader at that place says, you're protected by God. You guys are meant to do something big with your life. God's going to use you to do something very special with your life. You're protected. Everything's going to be all right. Work on yourself. Work on improving yourself. Contribute to society. Lead. Control your imagination. So Pastor basically you're saying you're a non-believer. Yeah. Because what you're saying is what we teach a person determines if a demon is really there or really not there. Do you realize how stupid that is? Yep. They're either there, Pat, or they're not there that's a, the bottom line and what you teach a person to believe doesn't change that fact in any way we have yep. to agree they're either there or they're not there the only thing telling the person that they are there might uh do is allow the person to see what is either really there or not there or not see what is really there or not there that's all it will do this sounds like the Pete Cabrera doctrine, don't you think? Yeah, look, definitely let's not get into that tool shed in this video. But, like, like, honestly, this guy literally thinks teaching people that demons exist will create a demon. Literally create yeah. one. Or at least yeah. the delusion that one exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 20 years later. I wonder what the consequences of those 10 kids on each side is going to be. Okay. One side, how many of them are actually going to believe they're waste to society, and maybe they're possessed, and maybe they're, and then the other. But this is stupid. Either way, who usually does better? The kid that is given a realistic, you know, who is told, listen, there are dangers in society. There are things that are out to get you, and you need to have your wits about you and be aware of the fact that you're vulnerable, or the person who is made to believe that they're, you know, Teflon. Nothing can ever happen to them. They can. Nothing can ever go wrong. They're protected. They're special. That's the dude who ends up ruining his life, making a bunch of stupid mistakes. And the guy who is given a very realistic, you know, act, you put the fear in him, even secular fear, even worldly fear. That, that's, that's what creates, you know, that fuels street smarts, right? Mm -hmm. It's knowing that, listen, listen, there are dangers about that you need to be aware of and you are not impervious to them. That's a dude who ends up, you know, actually being successful and not making as many mistakes. It's just some motivational speaker garbage he's and, on now. Yeah. You know? And I never I never believed in God or demons or anything. And my whole life people told me I could do anything. And then out of the blue the devil attacked me. Just ran. Right. Right. I wasn't searching. I just got attacked by the devil. So he doesn't believe that's over. possible. He believes you needed to be programmed for mm -hmm. that to happen. And he also said to become a productive member of society, you, sh you should believe you're not possessed. I was a productive member of society while I was possessed. Running a business, running different companies. Mm -hmm. I had a, a girlfriends, a nice car, a nice house. I was making money. He almost thinks like being demon-possessed equals... And when I say possessed, I don't mean totally taken over like some people. Mm -hmm. But demons were living in my body and I was functioning like a normal human being. You know what I mean? But he thinks if demons are living in your body, you're basically like face down in the gutter in Manhattan, like eating food out of a dumpster. Mm -hmm. When he when he faces the Lord, he's going to find out he has demons living in his body. Yeah. Beyond any doubt. Nobody with nobody with uh, no demons would have this Catholic priest spewing this foolishness on their channel. Right. You have to have demons to have a guest like this, given their perspectives and putting that out to, to millions of people. You have to, because mm -hmm. it's all lies. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, no, I'm supposed to do something big with my life because God's got my back. I'm destined. I'm supposed to. How that's going to turn out? Now, somebody may, you know, trash that argument and say, what the hell are you talking about? All I'm saying is I believe there's a lot of power when people of influence, their words have more power from the pulpit when they say things and someone's standing in the audience and a parent said, that's the priest, that's the pastor. I think sometimes people use that power too much and they hurt people and they hurt them permanently for a long time and it messes 100%, 100%. them up. And that, that, that upsets me a lot, a lot. It upsets because I've seen this myself. So for me, if I know there's power in imagination, if I know there's power in positive words, it, it's, it's more... There's not. Don't pretend you're a bird and you could fly for the next... 50 years of your life and you ain't gonna fly mm -hmm. there's not any power in your imagination mm -hmm. about trying to get that encouragement for people to believe you know you have control of your life you can do something with your That's life rather like look at where america's at right, right now what is america's biggest deal right now yeah it's law of attraction he creates his own future by what he imagines in his mind mm -hmm. basically he's his own god mm -hmm. like for me god holds my tomorrows he determined everything that's going to be in front of me yeah Nothing I want to think in my head is going to change what's going to happen. Exactly. Only what God wills will happen. And so it. it doesn't matter how talented you are, you are, how hardworking you are. If God doesn't want something to work out for you, it's not going to happen. And vice versa. That's why we see stupid, untalented people rise into the heights of worldly success. And I'm sure we all know that that like woman, that chick who has a beautiful voice who would never make it in, like she just wouldn't get chosen to be, a, you know, the next pop star or the guy who's really talented in high school at a sport, but just didn't make it to the league or you got you, that's not the path God wanted for that person. Right. Destiny is everything. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with what you're doing, but a part of it does is America is convinced that rich people are bad people. They're fully convinced that rich people are bad people. They're convinced. When you say, we got to tax the billionaires, do you know how many billionaires we have in America? 700 and 720 billionaires in America. Do you know what their total net worth is? $4.7 trillion. If you tax them 100%, that wouldn't the even be... The fact that you even know this shows you have demons, yeah. by the way. Like, yeah. I ain't worried about what all the rich people combined uh, has. Right. You think close to how much money they printed the last two years? $6 trillion. And you want to tax the billionaires? But because they say it so many times from the pulpit, people believe the problem in America is billionaires. So what if people from the pulpit said, the problem is you and I got to do something with our lives. If you can walk, talk, speak, you speak a language, you understand people, you feel, you have a healthy sense, you, you, help, you have the ability to learn and improve, you can change your life for the better. But that's not the messaging today. The messaging is victim, 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 victim. So for me, whatever the final product comes out of a denomination or a church or a religion is a byproduct of the leadership at the top. And that's where my challenge is with the accountability. Dude, I could tell my son he can achieve great things if he works hard and puts his mind to it. And also tell him the devil's real and he could be occupied in his corrupt flesh that he was born with on this earth. <laughs> Again, this is a false dichotomy. Right. Like you could teach a, a child that they have potential. You could teach a person that they could do great things. And also that they need to seek prayer for deliverance and get set free of their wicked tendencies their wicked tendencies that they have yeah and um just to circle back around to the last thing we spoke about i wasn't trying to say that no one should ever work as hard as they can at something the point is you are not god and it doesn't matter how hard you work if god doesn't want something to work out for you but if you are put in your effort into something the bible does tell us to do it as if you're doing it onto the lord and to give it your best effort because maybe god does want it to work out for you so right yeah that i wanted to say yeah that. you don't get lazy because god uh determined things exactly you know? mm -hmm. I don't that's know called I testing god right you question or not i just that's my biggest challenge and i think you know going back to even adam touched on the Catholic Church, his sins have been in the news for the last decade, you know, whether it's pedophilia, whatever. So for me to even go public on these things, I know that I'm throwing my name out there to constantly be criticized or to be judged. I mean, I had someone come up to me before in a restaurant and they said, Glad you know that, because that's exactly what's happening here. Well, Father, I have to tell you that every time I see a priest, I see a pedophile. Mm -hmm. So again, there is that notion that when you go public about something, that an issue that people may not necessarily agree on, mm. they'll try to attack you from a different angle. But I'm not afraid of any of that. I'd be the first one to tell you the church needs to be accountable for her own sinfulness.
See, that's a message that I think people can respect. Rather than running and hiding and sweeping things under the rug, you're saying, hey, listen, let me get out there and state my case. And I'm not trying to say that, well, now that the church talks about exorcism, this is how we're going to <laughs> re-exert our influence and control that we've lost no. because of clergy sex abuse. No. I think ultimately, even in the midst of abuse and whatever, the church still has to be authentic to what she's really all about, and that's promoting... Every other organization collapsed when sexual sin is discovered over and over again, but these freaks could be caught molesting little boys once a week, and the party just... The, the, the parade just keeps on drumming down the road. Mm -hmm. That's how twisted this garbage is. Yo. The message of love, promoting God. And, you know, there would be some people that might even suggest when you look at the sinfulness of the church... Is it the way that the, the devil is trying to destroy something from within? Mm -hmm. So whether you look at church leadership and how things are handled and all of that, is that a way to undermine the authority of the church? Have any of these priests that have been accused or even found guilty of pedophilia said that it was the devil that possessed them at that time? No, but I remember even uh, you know Pope Benedict even commenting when he was in office that there were many people that were ordained priests that never should have been ordained priests, that somehow they, somehow they were able just to, to get in. It's like a cancer that... Well, then he should have stepped down. Because he's running the thing. Yeah. There's no accountability. Everyone just passes the buck. Right from within. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we can't lament anything. We have to say, this is our reality now, and then how do we face it? And then facing our own... Imagine me saying, there were just too many ministers that got into power here that were molesting little kids. That's crazy. <laughs> I got. It. That's not my thing, though. Mm -hmm. I was in my department. I, I, I didn't see that <laughs> happening. I had no power. No flaws. How do we come out even stronger as a result of that? The greater danger would be just simply to run away in the face of criticism. I think we have to face our criticism. We have to stand there and we have to take it. Whatever ugliness or mud that people want to sling, mm -hmm. we have to take that. What can the church do to reverse this uh, negative outlook on the church that's been in the uh, spotlight for the last few decades? I think the church has to be even more public in the old Latin phrase, mea culpa, mea culpa. It's, admit it's admitting guilt. Mm -hmm. Not coming up with excuses <laughs> or whatever. It's not simply stopping the molesting. <laughs> we need to be more upfront about admitting the pedophile behavior in our church as time goes forward, brother. Yeah, no, the, the solution is they need to burn it down. That's what they <laughs> maybe, need to do. Maybe <laughs> stop molesting kids e even. Yeah. <laughs> Saying, I own this. I own this ugliness. Yeah, but is that good enough? I think it's a first step because we can never go back and we can't undo anything that's been done, but we can own it. And then ultimately all we can do is move forward. And then hopefully the experience of that ugliness causes the church to have a different outlook or view on the world and its mission. Because that's even when it comes to anything to do with the demonic. How do we take what the devil is doing and to turn it around and make something good come from it? Because we can't live in the past. We can't change the past. Ultimately, all we can do is learn from it. And then move forward. And it's so not the authenticity the past. of any apology will be manifest in tomorrow's it's behavior. It's still happening. So if you apologize today, then hopefully we see the church and the servants of the church and the priests of the church. Over time tomorrow, we see the service that we had all hoped it was all about. Best thing I ever heard was the following, and we'll wrap up on this. The, the best thing I ever heard from a pastor, you know, when I was like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this person? What about that church? And look what they're doing. And I said, listen, if, if your relationship with God's going to be horizontal, you're going to fail. If it's vertical, you'll be fine. He won't let you down, but people will let you down. People are always going to let others down because we're people. No one walks on water. We make mistakes. Now, that's a royal mistake by the church. It's, that's it's, a, royal, it's a royal mistake. But, you know, if you're going to lean on a church to uh, do 100% of things right, you will fail. My biggest challenge is when you have that kind of influence, don't use it to uh, impose so much fear to the point where you're, you're immobilizing people. Inject more hope. Inject more faith, inject more, you know, you and I can do special things with our lives and make a positive impact. And uh, that father of the two girls, I think that person is the one that needs to be held accountable at the highest level. That person needs to go to jail. You need to tell everybody in jail, here's what he did to his two daughters. What do you guys want to do to this guy? He's going to get Put roughed him, he, up. He's not, he, he won't last a week, by the way. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, look, folks, if you're... That's not going to remove the demons from the young woman because, you know, and uh, yeah, the problem with Patrick's last statement is that teaching people about demons does not put them in a state of fear that results in inaction it finally gives them you know a diagnosis for the problems that they are already witnessing within them 
so that they can take action and find a solution by receiving prayer. You know, but what Patrick doesn't want to hear is that you can't be a money hungry man and make it into the kingdom of God. Right. right. Acting upon greed and then realizing what well, I have such a strong force within me that so desperately wants to be incredibly wealthy. And then here, that's a demon. Right. That's what he doesn't want to hear. You could tell he doesn't like this topic in yeah. general. Mm -hmm. Like usually he does better like running the podcast or whatever this is or whatever show this is. Mm -hmm. Right. Is it a podcast? Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah. So he, he does a better job when he, he does motivational stuff, business stuff, because that's what he does. Right. But his faith clearly is not genuine because he really doesn't believe mm -hmm. demons exist. Right. From what I heard come out of his mouth. Yeah. Once you start saying things like teaching people this will make them, will make it real to them, mm -hmm. you're saying it's not real. Mm -hmm. You're saying this is something that people, you know, brainwash people into going along with. Mm-hmm. To this, appreciate I, think your patience. Pat I think Patrick likes to use Christianity because his conservative audience is Christian mainly. So it's yeah. kind of like a gimmick. It's a, it's a Trump situation where he's pretending to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. right. Every once in a while, I have certain topics that I uh, that I go into that some yeah. of you guys may say, what was this all about? <laughs> we were not expecting this today. This, but it came out of a, nowhere. A part of, a part of me starting this podcast wasn't because we want to make money. Uh, this podcast cost us money. The podcast doesn't break even. We lose money on this podcast, but we do it because we. No, no, that's a lie. How? That's an how? that's an absolute lie. Mm -hmm. I myself yeah. am interested it's, in some uh, topics. It's just like how Walmart loses money on eggs. You know what I'm saying? Sure, they might sell the eggs at a loss, but everything else is marked up, and so yeah. maybe technically, the amount of money that YouTube AdSense brings in does not break even the employees, the money he's paying to bring these guests on, et cetera. Right. But all his other peripheral business ventures, I'm sure, are reaping, you know, plenty of rewards. Rewards yeah. because of this visibility in this show. So And if if you're not making money off this, you're really wicked because you're not up here doing a non profit uh situation <laughs> helping other people mm -hmm. so if you're doing this to make to lose money that means your ego is so big that you just want to be seen on youtube every day and that's mm -hmm. your main motive yeah because you're not doing charity work over here mm -hmm. so you know that's a bigger problem then yeah one in you know living my life i want to learn about certain unanswered questions and i think today was a uh, a very qualified guest that was gracious enough to take the answers to the questions. Oh, to, yeah. He's qualified. He's qualified to go be to hell drooling on himself <laughs> and like bottoming out on the IQ scale, mm. failing to answer questions mm. and eating Twinkies instead of actually doing some deliverance. Mm. Pushback, you know, the, the questions Tom asked him, I ask or Tyler asked or Adam asked and you were very gracious about it and that says a lot about you as an individual and how you represent the church this was a very good experience having you here and i i personally appreciate you coming out i do want to recommend everybody if you are watching this and if you learn anything from it if you're th and also they're not going to push his book are they probably but just want to remind you he did say for any christians were like is don condemning a man to hell this man said that you can find god indirectly through islam through other faiths i think you know that's that was a fear right fear assessment change opinions change you know good or worse comment below i'm actually curious to know what some of you guys thought about this at the end of it after listening to the whole thing and uh if you do want to go a little further you may want to go order his book if we can put the link in oh, the chat oh, box they are gonna sell the book mm -hmm. oh yeah i thought he did i thought he did this just for free a work of charity oh oh the 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 the, the, the priest yeah they're mm -hmm. they're pushing his book here right I wonder if he gets a slice of that. Does he get a slice of that? Mm, probably, probably not. Probably. Or is not. that the trade off for this guy driving? Yeah, there? I think so. I think Patrick probably didn't pay him much, if any, money, but he gets a chance to promote his book on a very large platform. You know, everybody goes home happy. Right. And you have to buy his book because he saw someone's eyes turn green. Yep. Someone yeah. levitate yep. naturally. Yeah. No one else has seen that. Yeah. <laughs> If we can put it everywhere, Tyler, exorcism, the battle against Satan and his demons, 
uh, to order where in this book he answers the questions of how the church selects and trains priests for ministry of exorcism, where and how the devil operates in the world, why is it vital for Catholics to live in a vibrant life, life of faith? Where and how the devil operates. Like, like, where doesn't the devil operate? He's the god of this world. What to do if you He's suspect... He's like, I'll let you know where he operates in New York City mm -hmm. from the top floor of a <laughs> penthouse. <laughs> Presence of demonic in your life and how to fend off spiritual attack and build mm -hmm. a stronger relationship with God. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. This was wonderful. Appreciate yep. you. Uh, gang, I'm not doing a podcast this week. I know you are. Our guys are doing podcasts this yep. week. We're not doing anything till next week. But uh, we will be back. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for spreading some pure foolishness that ruins people's faith and keeps them from getting free. Appreciate that, Pat. Appreciate that. Great work. Good job promoting a pedophile religion, the Catholic Church. Anyway, we'll catch you guys later. God bless. Signing off. God bless you. More to come. Bye-bye.